All right. Hello, Fortinas, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is April 19th, 2023. Ah, you know what? It, it gets, it, it's so funny. I've been doing this for five and a half years, and it almost feels like I'm going on stage to do a presentation. I get so antsy. I get so like jittery and <laughs> I'm just like, okay, once I get going, I always know I'm good, but man, it's incredible. I, I was putting all these parts and pieces together, making sure I was like, man, I don't know if I want the layout that way or this way. And all right, but now I'm set. I hope everybody's doing well. We're going to do a, a we're going to touch on a few things here today. I guess nothing new, right? We're going to touch on things um tied into the last video i have stellarium up as you guys can see down here so we are going to show stellarium that i didn't show uh in the last video because i forgot and my computer probably would have crashed with everything that i had going on but <clears throat> we're gonna we're gonna talk about one thing to to show a little bit more exciting uh excitement to somebody we knew was connected to this time and we've known for a long time we also are going to go into Stellarium and show precisely what I was talking about, about the first month and third month, first month and third month. It's always the first month and third month. We're going to show it that, that in, in creation, we know the first month was in Taurus. We're not going to go all the way back to show that, but we know that it was in Taurus from history. And we're going to show it from Jesus where it was when he was here and where the third month was to his birth as we shared in the last video and see that it was the first month and the third month because of the movement of the sun and then show where it is now so everybody can get a clear picture i'll do my best as well to always mention the date the month and the date and stuff that we're looking at i may not always remember to do it but i'm going to try i know uh, we have actually some people that are blind in the ministry and so there was a request for me to make sure to mention the dates um, as well as scriptures so i don't always mention the scriptures but i i i have been trying to do my best to remember uh the scriptures i'm reading as well because i know people might be driving and they want to know where it is i'm talking about as well so uh, i'll be sure to stay on that as well so um, we're going to share those things we're going to see some more info about the sabbath <clears throat> and it's really interesting. One of our brothers, Keith, has been asking me uh, some info about the Sabbath and, and some things that he wanted to share. And it was perfectly, it, the timing was really interesting because it, this is also tied into the last video. I wanted to go in and to show that scripture literally tells us what the Sabbath days are. Or at the very least, what the first, oh, let's say two of the Sabbath days are. Okay, the two middle ones. And it literally tells us from scripture. And so you can devise from those the ones that the one that comes before and the one that comes after. And it's like we said, it's the same dates that we said on every month. You could say it follows the cycle of the moon. You know, if, if it's the cycle of the moon, you know, the calendar, the, the Hebrew calendar isn't always right on it. It might be a, a day or so. But essentially what it is, is it's the eighth day, the 15th day the 22nd day and the 29th day of every Hebrew, ca Hebrew calendar month is truly the Sabbath. And I'm gonna show you this in these places we're gonna share about the Sabbath and show why these connections are important also to the time frame that we're looking at here in this 70th year at the Feast of Weeks. Because within it, we're also trying to discern, are we looking still to the, the count from from the 16th day of Nisan, right? I believe that's the waving of the sheaf offering. And I believe I'm gonna be able to show it because of when John the Baptist's birth was and some things that we know that are that, that played out over thousands of years and things that are gonna be compacted into a shorter 14 plus 50 day period of time. So we're gonna cover that. And then as we keep going, I'm gonna share another little nugget um, I believe it was our brother Jake that shared it with me. And it was uh, uh, the word image found in the book of Revelation and where it's found in the Gospels. It's awesome because every single place it's found in the book of Revelation is directly related to the image of the beast. And you're going to see 
what the New Testament, what the Gospels tell us about this image. And then from there, we're going to go into something that that just recently started coming into my thoughts. And it had to do with with um, Exodus 34, 22, a very famous verse that we know here. And it, it was interesting because there was wording in it that just still I knew wasn't yet complete. And I think today you're going to be able to see greater understanding of it and realize that its connection is to John chapter 7. And how I started getting there as I was pondering Exodus 34, 22. I came across another piece of scripture in Revelation chapter 17. And when I saw it, I said, wait a second, we know this comma and story. And as I started going into it, I started realizing these two different groups that were there and started realizing that within these two different groups, one of them are the martyrs and the others are the saints. They're not the same groups of people. Saints will be dying during the tribulation, but the martyrs are a specific group. And you know exactly who you think that group is, right? We know who that is. So I believe I'm going to be able to bring more clarity to this today. It'll bring us into Revelation 6, Revelation 7, and, and shed more light on the, the ones who receive the white robes, why they receive them, why we see it in Mark 9. But it's going to continue to take us through, through, through a number of pieces from John chapter 7 that I'm going to show where these connections are in relation to the end of days. And it would appear that the story of John chapter 7, you know, John chapter 7, when we go to our chapters to years, one of the things we had looked at in John chapter 7 was this you know, because John has chapters to years, right? But the 14 years don't start until chapter 8. Again, which is very fitting because the woman caught in adultery, right? Like that typology of the bride. We've got the, the stone's throw, right? That he can cast the first stone. The woman's now standing before him. And then what do we see? Shining light in the darkness. We know that this storyline right here is as the Lord comes for his 40 days. It's, or you could say it's the start of the 40 or the end of the 40, because we know this is the period that starts the 14 years for the light group, which is related to Mark. So when it comes to John chapter seven, and we were looking at this in the chapters to years as the 21 years, the seven easy years, seven years of trumpets, seven years of seals, why is it that this is about the Feast of Tabernacles, all right? This is something that still was a head scratcher when we have something that we have been able to reveal in chapters to years. And I believe we have the answer to it now. And what was interesting about this is I was in Exodus and, and I was going back through Exodus there because of what I saw in Revelation 17 and then I get an email from this brother Jake again, who said he started seeing things in John chapter seven that he believes was related as if it's giving us a picture of what's gonna then take place at the end when the Lord is revealed to the world. And, and I thought, well, that's interesting because I was just literally going through Exodus and talking about this worker group and, and this connection within all of this being connected to what you're going to see about tabernacles in relation to Exodus 34, 22. And he responds back to me and says, that's crazy because I was just about to go study Exodus 34 again to find out what sort of connections were related to it at tabernacles in the end from what I saw in John. And so... This was a couple or so days ago, two or three days ago, and I kind of just brewed and let it ponder a little bit and then spent the afternoon last night and I think that mostly this afternoon going through it and I thought, oh my goodness. When you look at the wording carefully, it doesn't actually seem to be related to the beginning. 
meaning that it might very well be he's talking to somebody we know he talks to first. Yes, the Pharisees are there and everything else, but all of this is connected to how this all begins. Because let me show you something. In Luke chapter 12, it'll, it'll all come to understanding. I'm just giving you little bullet points. But you'll remember in Luke chapter 12, we have this very key piece of information. When he says in Luke, and it's only found in Luke, let your loins be girded about and your lights burning and you yourselves like men who wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding, that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. What does this mean? This means that right before the Lord takes the bride to go to the wedding, it would appear he's going to meet with his servants, right? The disciples, because this is to the disciples. It's not the apostles. It's not the 144. It's not the, the 12 tribes working during the millennial reign. This is the Luke 24 workers who are called his witnesses who are also, you guessed it, called martyrs, all right? Oh, you see, there's a bit, you can see it start to tie in now, right? He meets with this group first. This is what the scriptures are showing. They're pointing to this. And I believe I covered it in the, in the video called 50. All right, I believe I covered it in here. That when you see the storyline play out, this happens before the escape at the beginning of the 50 days. Then he comes back in the evening after the escape. He comes back on the same day at evening. He anoints the apostles, and then he's gone till the eighth day. Okay? And that's kind of where we're going to start talking about and, and show and try to bring more clarity and more light to help people understand it. But this being connected to John 7 within this group is connected all the way from the beginning of the end of days to the end of tribulation, when those who were the martyrs, those who were the servants, you see, those who were the witnesses are the ones who put their necks on the line are now going to be resurrected, as you're going to see later when we get into John 7, who are going to be resurrected when the waters flow out. When the living water goes out, it's pretty wild. All right, so we're going to get into all of that stuff. It's so much fun. It's always so exciting. And there's so much new stuff in here. So much, so much clarity and new revelation. That clarity that, that brings more clarity to parts that we knew. But to, to be able to say, well, who were these people that were dead, right? Who were those under the tabernacle? And it's not everybody, I've said it in the past, it's not everybody that dies during the tribulation even though they came to accept Christ. There are a specific group of people who put their necks on the line and some of them will have put their necks on the line and died for it. Not just having died during the tribulation because of their faith or because of disasters or famine or whatever even though they were in Christ, but a specific group who put their necks on the line. And when you get into Revelation 7, you're going to see that it was them, they, 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 and them. And when they did this, and they'll do this, and the Lord will do this for them. It's always talking about those who were given the white robes, not those who had the palms in their hands. It's pretty wild. So it'll bring a lot more clarity to parts, and I think will bring more revelation to a part that still had us saying, well, what about this? When everything else has told us Taurus at the Feast of Weeks, not even kind of, it's 100% Taurus at the Feast of Weeks. Which day is the true Feast of Weeks is still the ultimate question. And is this really the 70th year to which I say 99.9% .9 yes, but I leave that little bit because maybe there's something we still don't know. But we've gone from the beginning of, of Genesis to the end of Revelation 
And we've been now revealed the understanding of when they came into the land and how to count it. We see all the events going around the world. And I'm going to show you one that was shared in the forum as well by our brother Amish and then a number of others shared it. And I'm going to tie it in to today's video showing the timing is building right now to exactly what we said comes first at the escape of the bride of Christ after he after he lets the disciples know because they're watching expecting to go as the bride but thinking maybe they're workers he will let them know somehow that this group is to be ready when he returns from the wedding bam the escape will happen and the first attack will happen in northern Israel as we've discussed and shared many times and it's in the 50 days video and then all of that stuff starts so we're going to tie all of this together. It's going to be exciting. Oh, man, I, I'm going to stop before I get too far ahead of myself and, and go to where I always go to somebody who's new to the ministry. And you're going to hear something like the 14 years of tribulation. You're going to hear about the, the revelation of who the Gospels are speaking to. And this type of thing is going to make you scratch your head. But you won't be scratching your head for long. All you need to do is start with these three videos right here. And uh, our brother, I, I believe it was our brother William, sent me a great message the other day. When, when you guys hear me talking about the forum, what I'm talking about is, oh, it's not on there. I'll go back to it in a second. When you hear me talking about the forum, you can come and join us at ministryrevealed.com. Go to the menu box, click on the forum. It'll take you a few seconds to sign up and it's free. We've got 1,100, close to 1,200 people around the world, all like-minded brothers and sisters watching, praying, diligently seeking, and, and sharing and praying and doing all sorts of things in there. And our brother William had sent me a, a message about an intro video. Now, I've had people in the past send me you know, emails and, and calls about asking about doing an intro video. But I've explained that I don't want to do an intro video to start off my videos because I don't always do them the same way, okay? There's always something else. There's always maybe a little different way I'm saying it that might catch somebody's attention. I might be adding things along the way to talk about. So that's why I don't do it. However, he mentioned a great idea that never dawned on me before. And that was to do a little intro video, maybe a 15, 20 minute intro video with the key points of these three videos to, to get people's attention as we share that little video with others to get them to go to the Ministry Revealed website that I'm gonna, I haven't told Jimmy yet, but hopefully Jimmy will be able to add a page to the website where it'll be the intro page that people can go there. It'll be that little intro video link there. And then these three videos will be posted below it along with the book underneath that, that they could either download or link to the book page or whatever and either get the PDF for free, listen to it in audio there for free, read it from the website, or if they want a paperback, they can always go to Amazon. But a little short clip, 15, 20 minutes about these three videos, which is the beginning of the revelation of, to understand the end of days. OK, so that was a great idea. I appreciate William for that. And I am going to do it. Um, I'll probably start working on it tomorrow, just as there was too much going on with this and other things I was doing. So you'll see that coming out here in the future. And when it's done, I will post it for all you guys to, to be able to share with others. So for today, and <laughs> always, the way to understand, guys, so when you hear 14 years and who the Gospels are speaking to, you just need to start with these little intro Bible studies. This one right here will begin to reveal to you the revelation of who the Gospels are speaking to. I read from this. It's a 30-minute Bible study. You can go into the description box below the video and print this off. You can even go to the Ministry Revealed website, download all the videos, the info, everything, one-click downloads for free. This will reveal to you what people have called the differences in the Gospels, these, these discrepancies people like to call them. They're absolutely incredible. It started here about five and a half years ago. And you'll notice things like Jesus going to the cross. In Luke, he was arrayed in a gorgeous robe, which means white, radiant, beautiful. In Mark, he was arrayed in purple. In Matthew, it was scarlet. 
That's a discrepancy. He wasn't wearing three colored robes, right? There's a purpose for them within the Gospels. You're going to see other things like Jesus on the cross in Luke. He says, Father, into your arms, I commend my spirit. But in Mark and in Matthew, it says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the word forsaken means left behind. That's the, that's the Strong's Concordance definition of it. So you've got Mark and Matthew saying being left behind. Well, we know Jesus wasn't left behind. We know he wasn't crying out thinking he was being left behind. So what was the prophetic understanding? That's what it's all about. It's the prophetic understanding because you're going to realize that Luke is written to the bride of Christ. Mark is written to the sleeping church or what we call the world, the Gentiles grafted into the house of Israel that's scattered throughout the earth. Okay, that you can call it the sleeping church. Those, they might profess Christ, but they're not really living for Christ. They're not ready. They're not watching. That's the Mark group. They're going to go through the seven years of seals. The Matthew group is the ones who are going to go through seven years of trumpets. Oh, they're going to be here through seals, but Jerusalem will be destroyed at the start of the 14 years, and they're going to be scattered for the first seven. And in that seventh year of tribulation of seals, the Mark group rapture of the great multitude will take place, and the seven years of trumpets will begin for Judah. It's absolutely incredible. The Luke group is the portion in the above 14 years, which is 50 days, as I was saying earlier. In those 50 days, the bride escapes first. That pre-trib group goes first. And there's a remnant portion that remain to work. There are disciples who are the core group of Luke. And the apostles are from the John portion of John's gospel. And they will also be remaining during seals as well. I don't know if it's still 12 again. I don't know if it's more. And then you've got the disciples, which are the Luke group. So you'll see all of this develop. You're going to see that Matthew, Mark, Luke in the end, that's why the first will be last, the last will be first, is Luke, Mark, Matthew. And you'll see that when you realize that it's three separate groups of people being spoken to for the end of days, the prophetic understanding in the revelation of it, you're going to realize that each discourse is actually separate. And once you come to understand, you can come to this 11th video, the discourse is revealed. But that's what you're going to realize. That Luke discourse is going to play out. Mark's discourse and Matthew's discourse are going to play out. And they're all separate portions of time. The truth is, is it's seven years of seals and seven years of trumpets. You're going to realize in this third video, that's a big one. This is the glue. This is what puts it all together and gives the understanding. And it's all because of Matthew. Because we have all been learned. We have all learned, sorry from the gospel of Matthew for centuries because nobody understood who Mark and who Luke were speaking to. The seminaries, everybody teach from the foundation of Matthew. So everybody's eyes only seeing from the foundation of Matthew and saying it's only seven years of tribulation for Judah. It's because they don't know who Mark and Luke are speaking to. So it's as if they're at the end of Mark's gospel, which is the end of seals, and the seven years of trumpets are about to begin. This will help you understand that. These are the three key videos to bring that all into understanding, and I promise you it'll be worth every moment of your time. If you do want to come join us in the forum or check us out on our website, you can just come right here, join the forum. You can support the ministry here. We're not only here, uh, well, throughout the world and out of Canada, but we have a ministry with our brother Steve and, uh, and his guys out in Uganda that is exploding with Bibles out there that are being shared. The ministry revealed book. We're paying to get it printed over there. And they've printed hundreds and hundreds and they're run out. <laughs> they keep running out. We can't print enough because they're hungry over there, right? They haven't yet been given revelation. They don't understand revelation. And so they're eating it up like crazy. And so we're trying to support in all of these aspects and helping the hungry and 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 give blankets and steve is doing all these things out there so we've got gofundme we got paypal here and our information uh in the description box under the video as well so let me start with somebody we know very well in scripture somebody very well who we've been talking about for a long time and over the years especially at this time of the year we always go 
to share about this about him. And you know what's crazy? Is as time passed, we would go on to the next, right? But what's happened here, and we would try to associate him to another period of time, yet history tells us through, through commentary and so forth that has been passed down for hundreds and hundreds of years and generations through the Jews when he was taken by the Lord. Yet we, we try to push it because of other things that we see and think maybe it's at another time of year. Well, I'm going to tell you this right here, right now. Our brother, one of our brothers, Chris, had asked me something about, you know, uh, about another thing people are looking at. And I said, look, the reason I haven't commented on it is because I know beyond any shadow of doubt that the beginning of the tribulation, the beginning of all of it is connected 100% to Taurus. And the reason I'm telling you this now so boldly is because if by that one fraction of a percent that this isn't yet the 70th year and the Lord has more to reveal to us about it, you won't be hearing me talk about another possibility high watch date for the pre-trib escape until next year as the Feast of Trumpets is coming around. I'm pre-warning you guys, <coughs> excuse me, in case, by chance, this isn't the 70th year. <coughs> excuse me. But I don't believe that's the case. I fully, with that fraction minus, believe that scriptures have revealed to us that this is the 70th year. We did the count when they came into the land and everything else. The beginning of tribulation, the pre-trib escape, is absolutely connected to Taurus. And we're going to share a little bit on that here today. Okay? But here's another piece. Remember our great buddy Enoch, brothers and sisters, our dear brother in Christ, Enoch. Remember Enoch? All the days of Enoch were 365 years. We know that it's probably giving us <coughs> a clue in years to days. We've shared on these things many, many times, right? Because we know in many cases, things that were days will play out in years. Things that were years will play out in days. We've seen these typologies all throughout the revelation of the end of days. So wherever Enoch, whatever it was when he was taken, it'll be the end of 365 days as years when God took him. Right? That's not a mystery to us. That's something we've known for a while, right? We've all shared on these things. Well, the mystery, though, was where is this 365 days to the Lord God? Well, we know where it is now. The Lord God's time is the third month at the Feast of Weeks. That is where the Lord God's beginning is. It's the third month. That is always the Lord's timing. Okay? And that's why in the beginning, it was... First month in Taurus, and then it was three months later, right? Then when Christ came, the sun had moved by one month. So it wasn't in Taurus. It then went to Aries, right? And then one more month, and now we're in Pisces because the sun has gone off two months. I'm going to show that <clears throat> when we go to Stellarium so everybody could see it. So this 365 is 365 years as days. But we just didn't know when it was connected to when God took them. But that's not really true. I think just about everybody who studies prophecy knows where it's connected to. Yet for some reason, we get distracted because we think, man, it's got to be this time. And why did we get distracted by those things? Why did we look at, okay, maybe it could be this time of year. Or maybe it could be that time of year. Because we always believe that the connection in that year was the 70th year. But as the, the years progressed here in this ministry, we stopped going from, from, from feast to feast to feast to feast, from event to event to event. Some still in, in the ministry and the forum still do that, but that's not what I do. We, it's got narrower and narrower and narrower to the point I know it is connected to Taurus at the Feast of Weeks. It is absolutely connected to Taurus in the Feast of Weeks. 
at the, for the pre-trib escape. So what has happened, especially even in the last couple of years since Torah started being revealed to us, is we were looking less at every single event and we were getting a little bit more defined. And then last year, even more defined. If you remember what happened last year, for the first six months, we weren't looking at anything until the Feast of Weeks. You see? And then after the Feast of Weeks, because we still thought it was the 70th, then we were looking at the Hanukkah connection to the New Year of Trees and all of those things. Now here we are, back to the coming time of the Feast of Weeks and having been re revealed that the understanding is from the Feast of Weeks, then the 50 days to Pentecost, and then the 14 years begin. You see, it is the Feast of Weeks, whatever that true date of the Feast of Weeks is to the Lord God. So why is Enoch so important to us? It says, by faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him for before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is God and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And you notice how he's before Noah? Noah's the 40 days. What do we know about the 40 days? We know that the 40 days relate to the time of the Son of Man. What else do we know about the Son of Man? We know that his 40 days, as Noah's 40 days were, are connected to the time of his birth. And I believe that is going to help reveal to us greater clarity on when the true Feast of Weeks is, where the Lord is counting from. But I'm also going to show you that there's still the possibility that it's the week after, and you're going to understand why from what I was talking about with Luke chapter 12 and going to John chapter 20, right? When he meets with that group first, you'll see what I'm talking about when I get there. So we know Enoch is this brother that we all strive to be like, to be accounted worthy, right? To, to escape all these things, not having tasted of death. Well, people have looked at these things all over the place, over and over and over. And Jewish tradition says that Enoch was born at the time of Shavuot. The Bible tells us that Enoch was raptured by God. Jewish tradition claims that Enoch was raptured at the same time of year as his birth. You see, Enoch is a pre-trib escape like a rapture that we would call the bride of Christ. Now, Look at what the church always gets confused with, right? That Shavuot and Pentecost are together. We know that that's not the case. We have proven that here. It's seven Sabbaths <coughs> and then 50 days. So don't get distracted by that. The point is that Enoch was born and was raptured at the time of the Feast of Weeks at Shavuot. You know, we've shared on these things Again, a number of times in the past, right? Here it is again. Shavuot, Feast of Weeks or Pentecost, they call it, right? Don't get confused. The month of Sivan, Hanuk, Enoch, meaning to dedicate. Enoch was taken at the Feast of Weeks, and there are writings all over the place that show this out. We know that it's not the 6th of Sivan, right? Because it's got to be according to the cycles. That scripture tells us, which, are the, which is the 8th, 15th, 22nd, and 29th of the month. So the closest one, what would it be? It would be the 8th of Sivan. Well, we're going to share on that and why I'm leaning a lot closer to the fact that it is connected to the 8th of Sivan. You'll remember, why is this also a big deal? In Luke chapter 9, we haven't shared on this in a little bit. We used to share on this quite a bit. We don't share on it too much now because it's kind of one of those things we know like the back of our hands, right? But it says, starting in verse uh, Luke chapter 9, verse 26, 27, and 28. 
For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. But I tell you of a truth, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they shall see the kingdom of God. Okay? There's your not taste of death. Remember, Luke first, then Mark, then Matthew. All three will have groups that will not taste of death at the pre-trib, mid-trib, and post-trib. But they all speak differently in the three Gospels, and that is the point of the revelation of who the Gospels are speaking to. So what do we see? That first group that will not taste of death till they see the kingdom of God. Bam! You're in with the kingdom of God. Okay? That's the pre-trib rapture, not tasting of death, just like Enoch. Well, listen to what Luke 9, 28 says. And it came to pass about an eight days after these sayings. None of the other gospels in the transfiguration say about an eight days, nor do they say after these sayings. Because the revelation within the gospels, as we've shared many times in the past, this, when I first realized what this eighth day meant, my head almost exploded. I was trying to understand it for about a year and a half. But Mark and Matthews, we already knew. In Mark's, it's the typology of the Lord coming at the end of the sixth seal, at the end of the first six years. So remember I said, just like Enoch, the years are a typology of 365 days. Well, it's the same with this. These days are a typology of years in the end of days. And in Mark, it says after six days. Well, that's after the six years of seals of the Lord coming at, at the end of seals, just like you read in Revelation chapter 6, when, it, when everybody on earth starts hiding and freaking out because the Lamb's wrath is coming. In Matthew, it says after six days, because it's after the six years of trumpets, because at the end of the sixth year of trumpets, the Lord returns feet down on the Mount of Olives. You see? They're all a pre-mid post typology, and you're going to see that in the pre-mid post video in the intro series of videos. And when I realized what this was, is it means two things. It means it's almost in the big picture of 777, it's almost the eighth year. So just like Marx is after six days or six years, and Matthews is after six days or six years. Luke's is twofold. It's almost the eighth year about to start, which is what? Which is the first year of Mark's six about to start. But it's also something else. It's also still a reference to a day. So it has a twofold revelation within it. It's just about the eighth year, which is the first year in the big picture of the 21 that'll start the seven years of seals, followed by the seven years of trumpets. But this eighth day is also related to when the Lord returns from the wedding and begins his 40 days. So just like I said with the story that we know that Enoch is taken first, never having tasted of death, and you go to the story of Noah, and there was yet seven days, and then after seven days, what happened after seven days? That's about an eighth day, it's after seven. So sometime about the eighth day, the 40 days of the Son of Man in the typology with Noah begin. What is the story of the transfiguration? It's the typology of the Lord coming to begin his 40 days. You'll, like I said, you'll understand that in that intro video. So this is, this is a big deal. And again, it's showing us the bride going before the Son of Man starting his 40 days, just like the story of, of the ark. So these are things, again, we've shared on in the past, we've understood them, but not that we really get away from them, but you know, <laughs> you get to a different season in time, but when you think it's the 70th year, I mean, you, you gotta think, well, maybe then it, it's connected somewhere else. It's not. He was born and taken at the Feast of Weeks. The Feast of Weeks is to the Lord God the end and the beginning, the 365th day of the year. 
So if he is taken at the 365th day of the year, and this is the seventh Sabbath, then this is where they're taken. This is the seventh Sabbath counting from Resurrection Day. Okay, the morrow after the Sabbath, or it's going to be this as the seventh Sabbath, and this beginning the 50 days at the escape of the bride. It's one of the two. You're going to see it. It's, it's going to be quite interesting. I'm now even heavier leaning towards here than I am here. And as we shared, we know that this is Jesus' birthday. But more than that, we've got scripture that backs that it's at his birth that the 40 days of the Son of Man would begin. You see? But it could still be that this is actually the beginning, not so much connected that it's to his birth, but it could be the beginning of the 50 days. However, we see Enoch going first. We see the typology of the ark. We know that it's the seven to the eight days that come first before he comes. And just like the transfiguration story, just like Luke chapter two after Luke chapter one, just like Isaiah 9, they're all connected to the revelation of his birth. But then you got to say, well, why is John first, right? What is the connection to John the Baptist if there's six months between them? Why on earth is John the Baptist only the eight days before it? Well, we're going to share on that as well. So remember now, if, if, 365 is to the Feast of Weeks, and that's the year end to the Lord God, and then it begins. Do we have evidence of this? Well, of course we do, right? We've been sharing that quite a bit lately. It was all from that March 10th, 2020 video that was confirmed by the Holy Spirit. We know the Lord's God, the, uh, the Lord God's 70 weeks are 70 Feasts of Weeks, which is 70 years, but we had to understand from when they came into the land. So this isn't a mystery. We got this now. The Lord God is 70 feasts of weeks, which now lines up with Enoch, 365 days, and the Lord God took him. It also lines up with something we've also been sharing for a while in the Gospel of Thomas, one of the Apocrypha books, when it says the disciples, see, the disciples, which is key because that's a Luke group, tell us how our end will be. Jesus said, have you discovered the beginning, which was Taurus, that you look for the end? For where the beginning is, there will the end be. Blessed is he who will take his place in the beginning. He will know the end and will not experience death. There it is again. You see, that's the theme, because I believe I'm going to name the video Shall Not Taste of Death. All right? So we could see this theme. It's, it's all about before, the eight days earlier, that seven, after seven to the eight days, that means from day one. That is the escape of the Bride of Christ. Well, what about the Book of Jubilees? The Book of Jubilees tells us about the third month here as well. At the new moon of the third month, um, so this is the book of Jubilees, chapter, oh, what is that? Uh, 66, I think. Starting in, in verse 1. And Israel rose from Haran from his house at the new moon of the third month and came by the well of oath and offered a sacrifice to God of his father Isaac on the seventh of this month. Okay, so what are we going to see? We're going to see a seven to an eight days later. And Jacob remembered the dream which he had dreamed at Bethel, and he feared to descend down to Egypt. And while he was thinking that he would send word to Joseph that he should come to him and that he would not go down, he remained seven days. So that now puts us at the 14th day of the third month. So he remained seven days if he might see a vision whether he should remain or go down. And he celebrated the festival 
of the first fruits with old grain. This is the 15th day. How do you know? Because that was the 14th, and the, then it says on the 16th day, the Lord appeared to him. So what are we seeing here? You're still seeing something that still doesn't give total clarity because we see something from the 7th of the day, we see to the 14th of the day, and then we see the 15th day called the festival uh, uh, the the festival harvest of the first fruits of old grain. We know who this old grain is. This is the Leah, the old before the younger, right? The the old wheat, winter wheat before the new wheat, spring wheat. This is the pre-trib connection. However, there is some important information in this, and the reason I say that is because. When we read, and we'll cover this a little bit more later, when we read about these first fruits unto the Lord, let me show you, we're not going to go all of this in Exodus yet, but let me show you a, a key piece. You're going you're gonna to understand it when we get there a little bit later. But in Exodus 34, 22, it says, And thou shalt observe the feast of weeks of the first fruits of the wheat harvest, and the feast of ingathering at the year's end. Okay, so what is this telling you? The feast of ingathering at the year's end isn't the 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 feast of ta isn't the the feast of weeks, because the feast of ingathering is tabernacles. Pretty crazy, right? Because there's more than one year's end, but the Father has His, and this year's end in relation to the feasts is the Feast of Tabernacles, okay? But what we have to understand is this, the first fruits of the wheat harvest. We generally call everybody going pre-trib the first fruits of the wheat harvest, okay? The Feast of Weeks of the first fruits of the wheat harvest. But when you get into these nitty gritty pieces <clears throat> and you're going into the details of these things, what you realize is that it's more directed not to everybody going pre-trib, but you're going to see that this conversation later on, you're going to see that this conversation is more directed to a specific group of people from among them. Because it is the, those from among them who are the first fruits who are remaining to work for the Lord, who are those disciples, okay? We see this in Romans chapter 16, right? That we see Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus, who have for my life laid down their own necks, unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Salute my beloved Empetus, who is the first fruits of Achia unto Christ. This is one of the first fruits. Who are these fruit, first fruits connected to? Those putting their necks on the line for the Gentiles. For the churches of the Gentiles. When we go to 1 Corinthians 16, we see that there's another group. Okay? There's another group for the collection of the saints. You see, the, those who were martyrs are a separate group from the saints. You're going to see that later. And what we see in this is there's another group of first fruits. I beseech you, brethren, you know the house of Stephanos, that it is the first fruits of Achia or Achaia, whatever that is. You see, this is another first fruits. This one relates to the 144,000, whereas the one in Romans relates to the seals workers, which are the ones of Smyrna, which are the ones connected to Luke chapter 24. So when we're seeing these things with first fruits and, and this connection to, to first fruits and the discussion happening with them, I believe that this specific one and being told that they're going to be observed at the in-gathering at the year's end 
is a connection to the end of tribulation. That is when their observance is going to come. Because they're not all the pre-trib having been taken. Because remember, Luke 12 had those disciple workers, which are the Luke 24 guys, the witnesses who mean martyr. And their time will come at the end. When the waters go out, the living waters go out. You're going to see how all that connects. So I think when, when we're seeing a lot of this in relation to these first fruits, we need, to, we need to have this distinguishing thing within this. So that means two things. That means maybe the, the pre-trib still does go from that seventh into that eighth day, right? That eighth day of, of uh, Savan. And then he remains seven days, you see, for the wedding. And then what? He comes back for the old grain, right? That Leah remaining worker bride standing before him who is going to serve him? That's one possibility because that's when we know he returns. He's returning then on what? The 15th day to begin his 40 days. And look at that. There's the 16th. The 50-day counts begin. That's one way to look at it. The other way to look at it is to say, well, okay, he did something on the seventh day of the month. He remains seven more days, and then you could say, well, this is the pre-trib on the 15th day of the month. So you see, it's like when we look at this here in Jubilees, we still have, we still have another piece of, of Apocrypha pointing us to the third month between that seventh, eighth day to the, that 15th, 16th day. It still brings us to the same thing that we were talking about here, whether it's from here to here or from here to here. It's not a big deal to wait one more week, but there's so much more scriptural that leads us to believe, as we know, the Son of Man is going to fulfill 40 days connected to his birth. So it would seem highly probable that this is the beginning at the escape and the beginning of the 50 days. Okay, so let me show you something else that I want to eliminate, and we're going to go into their births uh, uh, in a moment. So in Zechariah chapter 7, I want, to, I want to settle this one because even within my spirit, it's just, it's kind of been unsettling for a little bit, but about Oh, probably a week or two ago, as uh, maybe a couple plus weeks ago, as this started to be revealed, the, the Feast of Weeks, then the 50, and then the 14 years beginning, and how it all connected to the timing of showing Christ's birth and showing the timing of Christ's death and resurrection, and how the sun is now two months off and not one month, <laughs> and showing how all that worked, I was now more at ease and I'm going to show you what I mean by that. Because we had this key piece of scripture. And we've been talking about it for over four years. Starting in Zechariah 7, 5 and 7, 7. It says, speak unto all the people of the land and unto the priests, saying, when. It's all past tense. Okay, When you fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh month, even those 70 years, did you at all fast unto me, even unto me? Should you not hear, verse 7, should you not hear the words which the Lord cried by the former prophets when Jerusalem was inhabited and in prosperity? See, all past tense. They're in prosperity now, right? They are inhabited now. And the cities thereof round about when men inhabited the south of the plain. Well, all of this obviously ends, meaning the last time they observed it was in the 70th year. So if they've already observed it for 70 years, they cannot observe it in the 71st year. And so the thinking first was that, let me show you what it is. The fasting in the morning of the fifth month is the ninth of Av. The fasting in the morning of the seventh month 
is the third of Tishri. The third of Tishri is for the fast in mourning of Gedalia, who was only governor for about six weeks. But the actual event happened on the first of Tishri. But because it's Rosh Hashanah and they don't know which day, the first or the second, it's going to fall on, they observe it on the third day. So there's two things to this. One is this is telling us prophetically, because we know Zechariah prophetically, this is telling us that according to their calendar, which must be the correct calendar, because it's saying that they observed the fasting in the morning of the fifth and the seventh month for 70 years. So if they observed it for the fifth and seventh month for 70 years and the prophetic of now, that they've been doing it for 70 years, then it can't happen in the 71st, 72nd, 73rd. You see? So the question then was, if it is the 70th and it went all the way to the Feast of Trumpets where the second attack was, would it be saying that the Feast of Trumpets is the end of the 70 years, you see? Could it be that the end of 70 years is actually at the Feast of Trumpets? And you, then you might say, well, then they observed the fifth and they observed the one uh, at the Feast of Trumpets. That would make it in the 71st year or that they observed it, right? Because, but the question is, this is where attack one would be and this is where attack two could be. We know the first attack comes to the north right? Northern Israel, Haifa and Tel Aviv. We've been saying that for years, and I'm going to show it to you in, in the news today. And we know the seventh month is when they're destroyed and they're removed from the land. And that's why it says, you know, 70 years they did that, meaning they'll never observe it again. So this was a big deal. And I want to show you something because I've talked about it in the past, but I want you guys to see something because what is the entire conversation that I keep saying? Taurus. Taurus is the month of Savan. When the sun is in Taurus and the moon comes over it, that starts Savan. That is the month of Taurus. So one of the thoughts that I was shared with you guys in the past, and I want to bring clarity to this so that we could dismiss it in the revelation. And that is, if Taurus, in the beginning, which it was Taurus as month one, okay? Month one is now Nisan over here. But in the beginning of creation, month one was the month of Taurus, which is now Savan. So if this was month one, we know that Christ in Genesis chapter one is called what? He's called in the beginning, God created. So in Christ, God created, or in Christ, the feast of first fruits, God created, which means in Taurus on the 16th day of Savan, which is resurrection day and first fruits, God began creation. The very first creation right here in Taurus on this date. Well, this date being first fruits, see, if you go to where month one is now, this is the feast of first fruits. And that is Christ on resurrection day. So if we go to Savan, this was creation and feast of first fruits at the beginning of creation in Taurus. So the question is, is God going to take it all the way back to where it was in the beginning. Remember, whoever finds the beginning finds the end. Is he actually going to take it all the way back to in the beginning and say, this represents true feast of weeks to me in starting in Taurus? And if he does, then guess what happens? There's your feast of weeks count, right? So the first Sabbath, right? There's the first day of the week at Resurrection Day. This would be Sabbath 1. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. And the 50 days 
would begin at the ninth of Av. What do we know about the ninth of Av? The ninth of Av is connected to an attack historically. And we know that when the pre-trib escape of the bride happens, there will be an attack on Israel in the two northern cities. And if you count 50 days from July 27th, 2023, and add 50 days, it brings you to September 15th. September 15th is the last day of the year. And you see, there would be the start of the 14 years at the second attack on Jerusalem that would remove them from the land for seven years and would begin the 14 years. You see how the alignment of these specific dates that we have in scripture are very telling. So if the escape then happened here and they're attacked, would they be observing the fasting in the morning of the fifth month on the ninth of Av? No, it'd be chaos. And it would remain chaos because that would be a short-lived attack in the Middle East that would break out before a settling down would take place. And then we know the Son of Man's 40 days are during there. Then the 50 days end, the second attack happens, and they wouldn't observe the fasting in the morning of the 7th. You see what I mean? It seems like, man, that there's some serious alignment if we go from in the beginning, Taurus, 16th day as resurrection day. You see? So you, you can understand why this would be on my mind still, yet it can't be. As, as impressive as it looks timing-wise, this is not the first month anymore. This is the third month. You see? And where Nisan is now in Pisces to start the year is the first month. It's easy to just simply say, oh, no, no, the Lord God, no, no, he is going to count from here because he's starting this at the beginning as it was in the beginning of creation this is the first month, and then over here at, what would that make it? Savan, Savan, Tammuz, Av. Av is the third month, and that's the way the Lord's going to run it. Well, that doesn't make any sense. Because the Lord God just finished telling us in, in Zechariah chapter, uh, chapter 7 that this was the fifth month fasting and mourning and that this was the seventh month fasting and mourning. So why would God suddenly just mix everything up and start calling this the first month just because that's where it was in creation? But do we have more evidence to this? Is there something else we can add to prove this out? Absolutely. I wanna show you the time of Christ's birth, okay? When we come back over here, this is now the third month. Ayar is the second month. And Nisan is the first month. Well, Nisan in our day and age is Pisces. Okay? The second month is Aries, and the third month is Taurus. So now you can see from where it was in the beginning, it was Taurus. And now where we are is a three-month difference to Nisan. But in Christ's day, <clears throat> it was Nisan in Ayar. So you see how it moved? In creation, it was in Taurus, month one. At Christ's death and resurrection, it was in Aries, which is now month two, but it was month one at his time. And where we are now, it's Pisces, month one, in our time. So what you're going to see, the connection to Jesus' birth and his death and resurrection, is you're going to see this at the time of his death and resurrection, which, was, which is Aries. And you're going to see that his birth is in 
Tammuz today, which is what? Gemini. So what's the difference between Christ's death and resurrection? Well, this was month one, Aries, in Christ's day. Because it was off by one month from creation. Today, we're off by two months from creation. So if this was the time of his death and resurrection in Aries in 33 AD, which it was, well, look at where his birth was. It was on the 17th day of what then would have been the third month. He was born on the 17th day. We, because we're now one month off further from him, we now have it as Tammuz, but to him, it was the 17th day. Uh, sorry, sorry, not 17th, sorry. It was the 15th day for us now, Tammuz, but to the Lord, in his day, it was our third month, Savant. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Here's the date of Christ's birth. Remember, see, Stellarium has a year zero. Minus one BC, and I want to show you this, okay? The sun and the moon <clears throat> in Aries, okay? There's your day one, okay? The fourth to the fifth is day one in Aries. This was month one, or what today we would refer to as Nisan, but for us, it's now over here. <clears throat> you see how it works? It was in Taurus at creation, at Christ time, month one was in Aries. In an hour time, month one is in Pisces, three months difference. So there's the sun with the moon, and let's see what happens. Let's go to find his birth. We know it's, it's when it's, oops. We know it started in Aries, right? Watch this. We just, okay, let me show, let me show you that again. This, one, this way goes really fast, okay? There's Aries, that's month one. Now we're going to the next month. Watch this. There's month two in Jesus' time starting. Taurus in Jesus' day was month two. Okay? And watch this. Here we come now to month three starting. Okay, now watch this. Now we're coming to month three starting. What are we looking for? We're looking for Jesus' birth. There's June. And where's Jesus' birth? Watch this. 6th of June, 7, 8, and look at what you're seeing. You're seeing Venus come into Jupiter, and what are you going to look for? The 15th day of the month is always full moon, right? Watch this. Bam! Right there. Jupiter-Venus conjunction outside of the moon or the sun at that day, but when the sun went down outside of the moon, this was the absolute brightest reflection in the sky. And look at what you see, 99.9. .9. Some days, some months, it doesn't go absolutely 100%. 99.9% full moon on June 17th of 1 BC or 2 BC on the Gregorian. What month is it? Gemini. Gemini. How can you prove, how can we prove that that means that Aries was actually month one just because he was born in Gemini at the full moon at the, at the, uh, um, at the Bethlehem star. Well, we can prove this by his death and resurrection, right? Let's go to 33 AD. And what do we see? In 33 AD, April 3rd, look at that. Full moon, April 3rd, 33 AD. Where is it? You guessed it. Aries, the sun is in Aries. Christ's death and resurrection was in month one, Aries, in Christ's day. You see? It's, it's first month, third month, first month, third month. And we know from our day and age that the sun is now moved by one more time. 
So that would make what? His death and resurrection, right? There's his resurrection, which in creation was right here, which in Christ's day and age was right here, which makes the Feast of First Fruits the 16th day of the first month in our day in Nisan on the 7th of April. You see? To me, that, that it, it's so clear. It's right there. If we go even to our day and age, let's go 2023, we're now in Pisces. Okay? Pisces. Sixth into the seventh. There it is. 99.8. Sixth into the seventh full moon. How do you get to the third month? There's a second. Bang, third month starting. When do you get to the full moon? Let's go to the full moon. About right there. 99.7% in Taurus, sixth day, uh, sorry, sixth month, fourth day in 2023 is the full moon of the 15th of Savan, Jesus' birthday. Hello. Remember that? Jesus' birthday? <clears throat> 1 BC, right? Gregorian 2 BC. And look at what you get. June 17th, Jesus' birthday in his day was Savan 15th. Okay? There's the third month, Savan. Count three over. There's June. Count three over on the same line. June 17th was the third month, 15th day. That's his birth, brothers and sisters. That just showed us his birth. So how does this connect to what I was talking about with Zechariah chapter 7? For as crazy as it looked of doing a count like this and calling it the count from creation, which is literally what it was, this date was the beginning of creation. Literally. But do I think the Lord God is bringing us back to as it was in creation and then starting out the counts? I don't personally believe so. And the evidence is found in the fact that when Christ came, month one was in Aries. That his death and resurrection which was the 16th day in Aries on Resurrection Day, is the evidence, because don't you think that when Christ came the first time, uh, when Christ came in the flesh and at his death and resurrection, even though the sun was off already by one month, don't you think that the Lord would have said, oh, <clears throat> but in the beginning it was this. The Lord would have already started it in the beginning. But he didn't. The sun was off by a month. And Christ fulfilled it where Abib really was in month one. And the time of the first month, which was Aries. So why would I think, knowing now that everything is off by three months or one month further from Christ, why would I think that this isn't actually resurrection? You see? It is resurrection. It is resurrection where it is today, where it was with Christ when he was in the flesh, and where it was with Christ in creation. And the further evidence is the fact that the Lord said, the fifth and seventh month that they observed for 70 years. What else is further evidence? It's the fact that Enoch was born and taken on Feast of Weeks. He was born and he was taken by the Lord, where am I? On the Feast of Weeks. 
which is the third month. So then the question still is, is it the 8th of Sivan or the 15th of Sivan? We know <clears throat> that this was the equivalent to his birth, which in his day was where it is, oops, which is where Tammuz 15th is today, which in Enoch's time was, oops, which in Enoch's time was the 15th of Ah. So when Taurus was month one, this Av was month three. In Christ's day, where Aries was month one, this was month three. In our day, where Pisces is month one, Sivan is month three. So if everything throughout history and especially Especially the evidence of Christ in the flesh when he came is evidenced in showing one month off in his day and the first and the third month. And now the sun is off by two months and we have the first and the third month. I don't believe it makes sense for us to say the Lord is going to count it all from here and start it all like that as it was in the beginning. You follow what I'm saying? Maybe at the very end of everything, when the end of tribulation happens, maybe it will be restored back to Taurus as the beginning and always remain there. I don't know. But we have historical evidence of Christ's birth and his resurrection proving that it was one month off and it was because of the sun, which means the two months difference as to where it is right now is actually accurate. And the reason for the Lord revealing to us through the Spirit the importance and the connection to Taurus is because that's where the third month Feast of Weeks is when the count to the true seventh Sabbath and the beginning of the 50 days will begin. Hopefully that helped bring more clarity to you guys. Because now I want to go a little bit more into whether it's this one or this one. And what's the main factor? This is Jesus' birth. Okay? This is, in our day, Jesus' birth, like I said, which in Jesus' day, it was this day. It was this month. But because the sun has moved by one more month since Christ, it's now here. Okay? So, if this is Christ's birth, I want to show you something. Remember in Luke chapter 12, where we were just sharing on this a little earlier, there, there's these two pieces that still have me scratching my head a little bit. Because in Luke chapter 12, as we shared here in Luke uh, 12, 35 <coughs> through 36, or you can even say 37, we know that he's meeting with this Luke disciple group first, right before the pre-trib escape. When we go to John chapter 20, John chapter 20, we see that <clears throat> it was, first of all, the first day of the week, and we read that Jesus was there, right? Jesus shows up. And Mary Magdalene is there, but he says to her, don't touch me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. You see, almost like you could say he's, it's during this time where he had met with the disciple group. He had met with the disciple group briefly before ascending to the Father. So he meets with the disciple group. He's then seen by Mary Magdalene. And bang, the pre-trib escape of the bride takes place. Now, why do, I, why do I show this? Because Jesus was there 
at the beginning of the 50 days. Right? Whether he showed up in spirit or however he showed up to this group, he was there before the 50 days. So even though we know this is his birthday, could it be the beginning of the 50 days? Could it be that this is where he's showing up to inform the disciple workers that he's about to take the rapture group, the, the pre-trib group out, and he's letting them know beforehand, and then he's returning, right? Then he's returning after eight days. Because when we continue to read in John, he returns what? Well, first, sorry, he returns, first of all, first uh, the same day at evening. So let me, let me repair, let me correct that. He meets with the disciples first. Oh, come on. He meets with the disciples first. He then takes the escape group, but he returns at the same day, it says in John, at evening. When he does, he breathes on the apostles and they're going to be the ones anointed for those seven to the eighth day. <clears throat> they're going to be the ones with this Jesus power and authority to just really start making a huge change. The beginning of this apostolic age is going to begin in the midst of the chaos, of course. Okay. And then what do we see in John 8? Well, then the, the Lord returns after seven to the eighth day. You see? So are we looking at this date, even though it's as his birth, are we looking at it as when he's coming to inform the disciples? Why? Why am I saying this? Because we see him there in some form at the beginning of the 50 days. So is this necessarily telling us that it's the 40 <coughs> of him coming after eight days? Or is it telling us the picture of him still being there at the beginning of the 50 days to inform those disciples and then bang to take out the escape group and then breathe on the apostles? You see, that is a possibility. But I do not really lean too far in that direction for it. Because if you remember... John's birth comes first. You see? John is born one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then John is circumcised, <coughs> excuse me, on the eighth day. What do we know about this storyline? We know this in the storyline going from Luke in order. Many of you guys that are new may not know this, but Luke talks about chapter one about how Luke knew all things in order from the very beginning. He knew them perfectly and had perfect understanding of everything from the first in order. And the revelation of this understanding is Luke chapter one is the typology of John the Baptist, who is the one spirit filled from conception, who is the typology of the pre-trib bride, bride of Christ group going at the date of his birth. And the ones remaining as the John type spirit filled are the disciple workers at the date of his circumcision. When the Lord returns at after eight days, right? In the typology of his birth. So Luke chapter one is about the pre-trib and then the disciple workers on the eighth day. When you go to Luke chapter 2, we have the typology of Christ's birth, which is, we've been saying for so long, that it is a typology of Christ coming at the 40 days, like his birth represented 40 days, so the 40 days of the Son of Man, Son of Man are represented by. But the question has always been, <coughs> in Luke chapter 3, is a typology of him coming at the end of six years of seals. And Luke chapter four is his coming at the end of the six years of trumpets. Okay. 
But what we'd always been trying to understand is, is this telling us in Luke chapter one that the Lord or the pre-trib group is going at the birth of Christ, you see, uh, sorry, at the birth of John, or do we go to Luke chapter two and the connection to the 40 days as the birth of Jesus? I mean, we know John came first and John was six months, approximately six months before Jesus. And in Luke chapter one, John is first. So should we be looking at John's birth? And this is why we had bounced around so much in relation to the time of Hanukkah or the time of the Feast of Weeks. Because of what we know of Luke in order and John coming first. But I want to remind you guys of something. <clears throat> in Ezekiel or Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 9 is very important. The thing that has been is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done. There is no new thing under the sun. So what do we relate this to? We relate this to what we have written in the book at Ministry Revealed, which is on, chapter, uh, on page 128 of the book about the seven churches. You see, we have the typology <clears throat> of the seven churches in the Old Testament. Well, this is a storyline that played out over 2,500 years or so. And in the New Testament, so that's the was. So the was has a picture in typologies of the is to come. And the is, which is from Christ till the day of the pre-trib escape, is the is of the seven churches that we're living in. That's both are what Ecclesiastes said, was and is, both shall be. So you've got about 2,500 years, you've got about 2,000 years of the is church age, and both are going to play out <clears throat> in the 14 year plus 50 days typology of the end of days. How on earth does that make any sense, that thousands of years to be played out in typologies over 14 and change years? That means everything is going to be condensed. Things that took hundreds of years or decades will play out either in weeks or months or within a year or so. There are gonna be events that get condensed into short periods of time. That's why the scriptures in the, in the discourses tell us it's gonna be worse than it ever was in creation unto this time. We've shared on this many times. Well, it's no different than the story of John being first. You see, John was born, of course, at the time frame of Hanukkah. We know that he was born at about the time frame of Hanukkah, give or take around there. And we know that Jesus now was born in the time frame of the Feast of Weeks. So we're not looking for there to be six months in between Luke 1 to Luke 2 in the is to come because the revelation of Ecclesiastes to what we revealed in the book is things are going to be much more condensed. So the story of John isn't that we were looking for John's birth, but we were looking for a period of time that represents the seven to the eighth day circumcision before the 40 days of the Son of Man begins. And that's what we're talking about. So what are we looking at? What am I saying? What does this mean? If this is the birth of Christ, which it is, then John's birth would be the week before, and this is the eighth day of his circumcision. Remember, a more condensed period of time. <clears throat> because in Luke, in order, from his birth and circumcision, there is no six-month period. We go into Luke chapter 2, 
And when we get into Luke chapter 2, we see the story of his birth. And it's the story of his birth and the representation of his birth that begins the 40 days. So you see, the debate whether it's this or this as the beginning of the, the seventh Sabbath or the seventh Sabbath, according to Luke in order, this would appear to be the seventh Sabbath and the beginning of the 50 day count. Because Jesus' birth is the representation of the 40 days beginning. So what else can we what else can we discern from this? Well, here's the clincher. Again, you guys know this very well. We talk about it regularly. It's in Isaiah 9. You see, look what happens. In Isaiah 9, starting in verse 1, Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as was in her vexation, when at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. This is what we've been saying in northern Israel. This is going to be the attack at the pre-trib escape at the start of the 50 days, at the typology of John's birth. At the start of 50 days, the pre-trib is gone. A remnant bride portion remains. They'll be girded about waiting for the Lord when he returns from the wedding. And at that beginning of 50 days after the escape, it will be Tel Aviv and Haifa that will be attacked and destroyed and a short-lived Middle East war will break out. This is the beginning. So like I was showing when we went to the fifth and seventh month, you see, we're looking at an attack happening at the beginning. This is why there seemed to be some validity. What do we know happens at the, at the end of 50 days? The second attack comes, and that's the one that's going to remove them from the land for, 50, uh, for seven years. That's why there appeared to be validity. But there's no denying this isn't month one. This isn't month two. Because Christ's birth and his resurrection prove the one month off in his time, which proves the additional month off in our time. See? So what do we see here? We see that uh, back in Isaiah 9-1 that these two lands will be attacked and afterward, a more grievously, uh, a, a more grievously afflicted area is going to happen. And it says, starting in verse 2, the people that walked in darkness have seen the great light. Well, who's the great light? Okay. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. And as we come down to verse 6, what do we read? For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. If this is the typology reference given to us as the first attack, and it 100% is, the next one we're given, which is the great light, the light that shines, who is Christ coming for his 40 days, he's not being told to us as an adult and him coming as an adult. We're being told about the time of his birth. We're being told about the time of his birth and the revelation then of Luke 1 into Luke 2 of the seven to the eight days coming first and his birth beginning the 40 days is being confirmed to us right here in Isaiah 9. What happens when his 40 days are done and then the 50 days are over? As we know, verse 12 of Isaiah 9, then Syria before and the Philistines behind come and devour them. That's the attack after the 50 days. Which, again, it would maybe seem like the connection could be the, the Lord beginning in, in Sivan, in Taurus. But we have confirmation right here that the time of his birth is connected to the 40 days. So this once again proves out that the Lord isn't counting this as month one and this as month two and this as month three because he's telling us 
yet again as Luke 2, that after the attack that takes place in Haifa, in Tel Aviv, the two cities in the north that Iran is going to destroy, it starts, as we have always known, at the beginning of the 50 days after the escape, which again puts the birth of Christ from after seven days to the eighth day. Do you see why I am now more leaning highly, heavily to the eighth of, of Savan as the true count to the Feast of Weeks? Because look at where the count begins, guys. The 16th of the first month, Nisan. Not from this as the Sabbath after, and this being the count, that takes us to the 15th. You see, remember why this is so important? This was the date of creation when creation was in Taurus. This was the date of resurrection when Christ was here in Aries. Which means this is the date of the resurrection where we are one month off from where it was with Christ with the Son and two months off from where it was in Taurus in creation. Which means this is the beginning for Christ. So if this is the beginning, this is where the count begins for the Sabbaths. Which means this is the first Sabbath, the second Sabbath, the third Sabbath. So, sorry, I'm counting from April 7th on Savan 16 as the beginning of the weekly count to April 13th. And that makes Nisan 22, April 13th, the first Sabbath. It makes April 20th, the 29th of Nisan, second Sabbath. <coughs> it makes um, April 29th, the 8th of Iyar, the third Sabbath. May 6th, the 15th of Iyar, the fourth Sabbath. The fifth Sabbath is May 13th, the 22nd of Iyar. The 6th Sabbath, the 20th of May, the 29th of Iyar, and it makes the 7th Sabbath, the 28th of May, the 8th of Sivan. Which means the pre-trib escape of the Bride of Christ, the 28th time frame of May 2023 at the 8th of Sivan, which means that what we see in Luke chapter 12 and the Lord coming to warn them right before the escape would happen earlier in the day <clears throat> from the 27th to the 28th of May to which he would then escape the bride of Christ and on the same day at evening would come and anoint the apostles and you would have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, to the Lord returning on the eighth day, from the eighth actually, to the Lord returning on the eighth day, June 4th, the 15th of Sivan, <coughs> as his birthday, as Luke 2 said, at his birthday, as Isaiah 9 said, which means the first attack happened after the escape of the Bride of Christ about the 28th of May, 2023. And do you know that we have evidence for that? Do you know what's going on in the world right now? They've literally told it to us. Do you know that? Listen to this. This is from a couple days ago. This is from the Jerusalem Post, it's in the Israeli Times, it's in Brit uh, um, uh, Christian Broadcasting News, Tehran Times, Iran News, it's all over the place. Let me read it to you. This is from April 18th, yesterday. April 18th from the Jerusalem Post. Iran will destroy Tel Aviv, Haifa at the slightest Israeli action. So they gave a big talk and they have declared the two cities that they are prepared to 
destroy. And it was in a parade on the National Army Day Parade in Tehran, Iran on April 18th. Okay, that's the picture from April 18th, 2022. But it was declared again in 2023. Guys, this is exactly what we've been talking about. Okay? This is exactly, and it's all over the news again. <clears throat> it's not going to let me get out of here. There we go. It's all over. Oh, I'm going to get out of here. This is a terrible website. And it's all over the news again, guys. It's literally Isaiah 9 that we have been declaring even before we found Isaiah 9 would come to pass because we know there's a first attack and we know there's a second attack. It was all part of the revelation of the 50 days. And now I'm able to prove with Stellarium, which I'm going to close now, with Stellarium, <clears throat> with history, that it cannot be on the other side that the Lord begins the official count of 50 and then the 14 years. Because historical evidence shows that the, the sun's movement is still in effect. And just as the 14ers did, true Abib, which was in Nisan this year, true Abib did take place, which meant this was the time of Passover, his death in the grave, and his resurrection. The original 14ers knew it because of Abib. Polycarp was a 14er, knew it because of Abib. And they put their life on the line. One of the reasons was because of their true faith in Abib. And that's why they were called 14thers, observing the true 14th day. And as I've said before, just so happens we are true 14thers because of the truth of the revelation of the 14 years. Isn't that crazy? <clears throat> what did I just show from the beginning? Enoch, 365 days as years. The, the transfigurations, days, represented as years. The original 14thers stood on 14th day as true Passover, regardless of the day of the week. And we are, what, 14 years from the truth of the revelation. You see, regardless of what others say about seven. Days as years, years as days. It is throughout prophetic understanding revealed in Scripture. It's awesome. It's everywhere, guys. It's incredibly, incredibly exciting. And I hope that that cleared up a whole bunch for you. And the fact that they're talking about it literally in the news, <clears throat> declaring what they're attacking. Some are thinking, you know, we're right here, 19th of May, uh, of April, the 28th of Nissan. Some people are thinking, man, there's no way we're going to get to late May. Well, we thought that with uh, we thought that with the uh, uh, pandemic as well, right? But we know it. We know that it will be in God's perfect timing. This attack with Iran and Israel in this short war that's going to break out in the Middle East is prophecy. It is absolutely the beginning of prophecy right at the time of the escape of the Bride of Christ, and the fact that his birth to reiterate, is the 15th of Savan is the evidence from Luke in order, chapter 1 and 2, is the evidence seen also in Isaiah 9 that the seventh Sabbath of the true time of the Feast of Weeks is the 8th of Savan, the 28th of May. Depending what side of the world, maybe it's a little earlier, maybe it's a little later. All right, but the 28th of May. And so buckle up, brothers and sisters, or get ready to unbuckle and go be with the Lord. Because this being the 70th year, it is all connected to Taurus. I promise you with all of my heart, it is connected to Taurus. That was the revelation for anybody that didn't get it. I know there are some that still probably don't believe it because it didn't happen to them. But I even showed you the evidence. What happened to me, I showed the revelation in Scripture. 
I showed the historical history evidence of it. It is all connected to Taurus. So get ready, because this be the 70th year. Let me show you something else <laughs> connected in all of this. And that is the ability to understand the Sabbath days once and for all perfectly clear. Okay, we see right here in Leviticus 23, verse 3, six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest. And look at this. It's also a holy convocation. Now, what you're going to see is not every Sabbath uh, is only a holy convocation. Okay, the, there are feast days that are holy convocation. Look at this. Passover. These are the feasts to the Lord holy convocations okay which means a sabbath is a holy convocation but so are feast days that don't land on sabbaths they're also holy convocations so everybody knows that the seventh day is the sabbath so how can we really understand it from scripture <clears throat> because we hear jews everywhere telling us that it's Friday into Saturday, right? This is always their Sabbath, and that's the way it is no matter what. Now, here's the thing. It doesn't really matter where you choose to observe the Sabbath, okay? That's what we get. We understand this from Colossians chapter 2, verse 12, I think it is, uh, 16. Okay, let no man therefore judge you in meat, so what you eat, or in what you drink, or in respect of a holy day, or the new moon, or the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Let no man beguile you of your reward in voluntary humility. Okay, why? because nobody falls in line with what the true understanding of it is, <laughs> right? The Jews have just accepted Saturday because it's every single uh, uh, seventh day that if they continue to follow it, well, that's just what it is. But it's not biblical, you know, and then you got the church doing it on Sunday. It's not biblical, just like Easter. It's not biblical. The Lord doesn't say, oh, I want you to go observe Easter. But he's not against, if you're truly observing the, the Lord's day, he's not against you just because you have it in the wrong place. Okay? But there's a reward. You're going to be rewarded for, for voluntarily wanting and desiring as you diligently seek the Lord <clears throat> to want to observe these things. But there's, there's no punishment for having it on the wrong day. And yet all these people argue and argue over these things, okay? It's not about argument. And the reason I'm sharing this with you has nothing to do with argument. But you know what it has to do with? Being able to understand the timing. If you're observing these things all on the wrong date, mishmashed everywhere, you're not gonna actually understand the true timing. And we're trying to understand when the Lord's coming. Because we know it's Luke, Mark, Matthew. In Matthew, he said, nobody knows the day or hour. Well, that's not the week or month or year. In Mark, he says, nobody knows the day or hour. But that's not the week or month or year. Do you realize Revelation 16 tells us this? <clears throat> Do you know that if the Lord wanted to, to say, but nobody knows the day or the hour or the month or the week? Do you know he could have said that? Do you know he tells us exactly that? Listen to this. Where is it? I thought it was here in Revelation 16. I think it is. Did I miss it? Did I miss it? Let me check 15 real quick. Because uh, there's a piece of scripture 
shoot, I don't remember it was. <clears throat> There's a piece of scripture that says that have been reserved for a day, for an hour, for a day, for a week, for a month, and a year such as this. You see? And so when Mark and Matthew say nobody knows the day or hour, it also doesn't mean that they can't get the week time frame, the month, the year that these things would happen in. The problem is people think that those are the pre-trib, but they're mid and post. You see, the difference that you have in Luke's is it says none of that. You see, it says, watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Hello. This is why when we're going into this, we want to best understand to the best of our ability where these events will actually take place. Are we counting them properly? Should it only be, excuse me, 49 days and then 50? No, because it told us Sabbaths. So what is a true Sabbath? A Sabbath is more than one thing, by the way. I'm going to prove it to you in a moment. The Sabbath is obviously the seventh day of the week, and it is a holy convocation. But from this, you don't know necessarily which day is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay? Then you find out that the feasts of the Lord are also holy convocations. Okay? So, as we said last time, the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. You know, the first day is a holy convocation. Okay? So, what did that tell us? It says, this is the beginning of unleavened bread. Unleavened bread lasts seven days. I don't know why they go to the eighth. It makes absolutely no sense. There is no eighth day of unleavened bread. But it says that it starts with a holy convocation and that the seventh day is also a holy convocation. Well, check it out. The 15th is also a Sabbath. Okay, this is also a Sabbath. And we know this from what we showed even last time going into Luke 23 because it says in Luke 23 54 you know when Jesus was taken down he was putting in linen it said and that day was the preparation and the Sabbath drew on okay which means that Christ was in the grave so they sorry he was crucified and had to be put in the grave before the Sabbath began, which is the 15th day. And what was the 15th day to the 21st day for seven days? That's unleavened bread. But it told us that it started on a holy convocation and that the last day of the feast would be a holy convocation. The first day is a Sabbath when he was in the grave. And the last day of unleavened bread is also a holy convocation, but it's not a Sabbath. You see, the day after is the Sabbath. Do you get it? Because this is a Sabbath, which means this is the first day of the week. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This is the next Sabbath, which makes the 15th and the 22nd a Sabbath. And because Passover or Unleavened Bread Week starts on the Sabbath, a lot of people have wondered, is this where the true Feast of Weeks count should begin, or should it be the Sabbath after unleavened bread that it should begin? So this is the Sabbath, and this is where the week counts, which makes this the first Sabbath and not this the first Sabbath. I now believe that it is supposed to be counted from here, and this is the first Sabbath, which takes us to Savan 8. Okay, we'll see this as we keep going in Leviticus 23. And there's a very key piece of scripture. <clears throat> okay, so that's why so many people get mixed up. You'll have Jews. I saw a very strong Messianic Jew, Zev Prost, who was talking about, no, that this is the, the high Sabbath. So Jews want to say, no, we got to count it from here. Or Christians say, no, we got to count it from here because this is the Jews' Sabbath, which means it counts from here. No, not at all. And there's no mention that this is this high Sabbath. They call it a high Sabbath because 
it's the unleavened bread. It's part of unleavened bread. But when you see when the, the sheaf of the wave offering takes place, there's no way we can deny and say that it's a week later because the sheaf of the wave offering is at first fruits. And Christ is first fruits on the 16th day of the first month. So there's no way that this is the waving of the first fruits. You see? But what is it? It's when he came back the eighth day. You see? This is John chapter 1. No, it's John chapter 20. On April 7th, the equivalent Nisan 16 is John chapter 20. Don't touch me. So he's going to meet with those disciples and tells her, don't touch me. Then he's going to, what? Take the rapture group, the pre-trib rapture group, like a rapture, going to the third heaven. And then on the same day at evening, he's coming back and he's going to anoint the apostles. The, the apostles. And then he returns what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then what? The eighth day. He's returning on the eighth day. You see? This is the historical connection of where it took place and how it's perceived that it played out at the time of Christ. But what do we know is the revelation of the end of days? We know from 1 Corinthians 15, right, that he met with this group. Then he met after that with another group. After that, he met with another group. We know it related to Mark's group, uh, to Matthew's group, to Mark's group, to John, and then to Luke's group as one being born out of due time. And that is the revelation of the pre-trib escape. And it starts off with a Sabbath count. Matthew group, Mark group is the seven Sabbaths. So during these seven Sabbaths that start here, he had met during this entire time of that seven Sabbath count with those groups. And then what? Then he meets with the, the pre-trib escape group, or you can say then he met with the John group, right? To breathe on them. And the escape group took place. It's the start of the 50 days. But in, in what took place, that is the prophetic, right? That is the revelation of the prophetic built in to the is that happened. And it's 1 Corinthians 15 and the revelation of the end of days that gave it to us. Seven Sabbaths, 50 days, seven and seven as the years of Shemitah years, and then the 50th year. Do you get it? Days count. Years count. Hello. <laughs> it's everywhere. Maybe I should change that to the title. You'll know it because you'll see it before me. Days to years, maybe years to days. Maybe that'll be the count. Maybe that'll be the title. Uh, at this point, you'll already know who cares, right? I needed to make a note. So what we're seeing is is the ability to understand this in relation to what the true sabbaths are well as we go now further let's go down so see look at this then shall you bring a sheaf of the first fruits this is jesus first fruits of your harvest under the priest and he's going to wave it well jesus is the first fruits right in the in the creation he is the feast of first fruits as well that's how we know creation was on the 16th day of the first month, which was Taurus back then. So if that's the 16th day, then how on earth can I say that this is the Sabbath that we, that it's after that Sabbath and begin the count here? There's no correlation to creation being this. It's this. And the evidence of it being creation was when he came and the sun was one month off and where it is now when the sun is two months off. There's no correlation to the 23rd of Nisan. You see how everything's building and building and building saying this is truly the seventh Sabbath? Well, let me prove it out even further. Let's go to tabern uh, tabernacles and listen to this. 
Starting in Leviticus 23, verse 33, uh, let's start in verse 34. Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of the seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles, seven days unto the Lord. The first day shall be a holy convocation. See that? The first day shall be a holy convocation. But you know what it didn't say? Shoot, it didn't say it was a Sabbath. It would really help <laughs> if one of these would tell us it was a Sabbath. Because it didn't do that at the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Even though it began on a Sabbath, it only said that the first day was a holy convocation, just like it did here with tabernacles. Okay, verse 36. Seven days shall you offer an offering made unto fire, unto the Lord. On the eighth day shall be a holy convocation. So this time, the seventh day isn't a holy convocation like it was at the Feast of, of Unleavened Bread, right? At the week of Unleavened Bread. As you see back in Leviticus 7 and 8, uh, 23, 7 and 8, it says, in the first day shall be a holy convocation. Well, we know it was the 15th day. And it says, and you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord seven days. And in the seventh day is a holy convocation. Well, the seventh day isn't a Sabbath. We've just shown that, right? Because it starts on the 15th. Seven days, including the 15th, is the 21st. It can't be a Sabbath. So we've, we've already shown that. But this one said the seventh day is a holy convocation. When you come down to tabernacles, or Feast of Booths, Feast of Tabernacles, it just said the seventh day was a holy convocation. And then it said the eighth day was a holy convocation. Okay? But seven of those days are the offering made by fire, and the eighth day is a holy convocation unto you. And you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. It is a solemn assembly. Verse 37 of uh, Leviticus 23 says, These are the feasts of the Lord, and it describes it again. Well, now listen carefully, because this is the evidence of all evidence. This is all we need right here. Leviticus 23, <clears throat> uh, 39. Also, in the 15th day of the seventh month, hello. So, also, on the first day of tabernacles, on the 15th day of the seventh month, when you have, there it is, gathered in. <clears throat> Remember I was telling you something about the word gathered in, connected to uh, Exodus 34:22. Also, in the 15th day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the fruit of the land, listen to this, you shall keep a feast unto the Lord seven days. See that? Seven days. Let me make it dark. So again, it's the same seven days of the Feast of Tabernacles, starting on the 15th day. You're going to keep a feast unto the Lord seven days, starting from the 15th day. Now listen to this. On the first day shall be a Sabbath. A Sabbath. What does that make the, the 15th day of the seventh month? Not only is it a holy convocation in the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles, we are just given clarity that it's also a Sabbath day. When we were in Luke 23, we saw that the 15th day <clears throat> from, uh, from unleavened bread, after his death and resurrection, I mean, after his crucifixion, when he put in the tomb, that was also a Sabbath day, which is the 15th day of the first month. We're now told that the 15th day of the seventh month in the Feast of Tabernacles, that the first day of it is not only a holy convocation, but we're given clarity that it's also a Sabbath. But listen to this. Is the seventh day a Sabbath? No. Listen to what it says. And on the eighth day shall be a Sabbath. 
and on the eighth day shall be a Sabbath. So what does that mean? Let's go to the calendar this year to give you the picture. The 15th day of the seventh month, this year is September 30th. September 30th, the 15th day of Tishri, is the beginning of Tabernacles, and it's called a Sabbath. Now, for the Jews this year, they're like, see, it's a Sabbath, told you. But the reality is it's just because of where the 15th day of the seventh month fell. It's a Sabbath, and it begins Tabernacles. It is a holy convocation, but we're also told it's a Sabbath. So it's day one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The seventh day wasn't called a Sabbath but the eighth day was. What is this proving, guys? It proves that the 15th day is a Sabbath of every month. It proves that the seventh, uh, that the 22nd day of the month is also a Sabbath. So what do you think it was the week before? The eighth day and the week after? The 29th day. Brothers and sisters, in Leviticus, the Feast of Tabernacles along with being able to show it from month one with the crucifixion that the 15th day is not only a holy convocation, it's always going to be a holy convocation because it is a Sabbath, but it also told us, just like when we read in the Feast of Unleavened Bread, in the Feast of Unleavened Bread, it called the seventh day. Well, Tabernacles just told us the 21st day is the seventh day. So if we go to the 21st day of Nisan, it's telling us that it was a holy convocation, but it didn't tell us it was also a Sabbath. Hello. And then Tabernacles just told us that the eighth day, the 22nd day of Tishri is a Sabbath, which means so is the 22nd day of Nisan, the first month, a Sabbath, which makes it what? The eighth of Nisan, the 15th of Nisan, the 22nd of Nisan, the 29th of Nisan. Brothers and sisters, we now know that the true Sabbaths to the Lord are the 8th, 15th, 22nd, and 29th day of every single month on the Hebrew calendar. Hello. Done deal. Understood. Now let me show you some other key pieces in relation to this eighth day, okay? When we go into Luke in order, look at what we find. We find John the Baptist, of course, right? We find the, the birth of John the Baptist. And at the birth, where am I? At the birth of John the Baptist in verse 57, Luke 1, verse 57, and then verse 59 is his circumcision. At his birth, what do we see? His birth, and then you have what? The eighth day is his circumcision, right? When you go to Luke chapter 2, we see Jesus' birth, and then we read about the eighth day in Luke chapter 2, verse 21, we see from his birth, and then we see the eighth day of his circumcision. Now, here's the thing. Does it mean that every male that gets circumcised is circumcised on a Sabbath day? Or, or the day after, the, yeah, I guess on, on, on the Sabbath day, which means he would have been born on a Sabbath, and every male is then circumcised the following one, right? Let me show you here with this. For example, are we saying then that here's the birth, right? There's day one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then there's the eighth day circumcision. Because what does it say? Right? Circumcision, is it always happening on the eighth day? Is it always going to happen on a Sabbath? You see, males are obviously born at every day of the week. But they're always circumcised on the eighth day. Now, with John and with Jesus, 
there's a connection to being born on a Sabbath and circumcised on a Sabbath. Did you catch that? Because Jesus would be born on the 15th of Sivan. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The eighth day would be the 22nd of Sivan or June 11th this year. So in Luke chapter two, the connection to Jesus' eighth day circumcision would be the 22nd day of Sivan. That would have been the date of Jesus' true circumcision. But it's also believed connected to be why we're given the seventh and the eighth day circumcision in John in Luke chapter one for John, and why we're given the, the birth and then the eighth day circumcision for Jesus. Because chances are the connection to John as well as Jesus is that John's typology here is he's born on a Sabbath and then eighth day <clears throat> is the circumcision. So what do we have? Just so happens the seventh Sabbath the beginning of the seventh of the eight days in his circumcision to the time when Jesus comes as his birth to start the 40 days and the time of his circumcision on the eighth day, which is a Sabbath. But it doesn't mean that every male is circumcised on an exact Sabbath day, but they are all circumcised on the eighth day, which is seen as what? A Sabbath day. Let me show you this in John chapter 7. He tells them, I know I did these in bright red on it. I did it on purpose. But remember, they're upset with them because, listen to this. Starting in John 7, verse 21. Jesus answered and said unto them, I have done one work and you all marvel. Moses, therefore, gave unto you circumcision, not because it is of Moses, but of the fathers. And you, on the Sabbath day, circumcise a man. If a man on the Sabbath day <clears throat> receives circumcision, that the law of Moses should not be broken, are you angry at me because I have made a man every whit whole? on the Sabbath day? When you read this, you might think, oh, well, that means everybody has to be circumcised on the Sabbath. Well, no, it's telling us the eighth day. Every eighth day from the birth of a male is his Sabbath day circumcision. It's the Sabbath day from his birth. What is that telling us? It's also adding. You see, because we just proved scripturally that the 15th and the 22nd of every month is a Sabbath. This helps us prove that if Nisan 1, for example, is somebody's birth, right? So take the, the first day of any month, but take the Nisan 1, for example. That means like somebody's being born. Okay, so somebody's birth has just started. They were born on Nisan 1. That means on the eighth day is their Sabbath, is their circumcision. So it's telling us the eighth day of every month is also a Sabbath, just as the birth of a year or the birth of a month. Okay, the start of every new month. The eighth day is the Sabbath. Hello. We can now prove the eighth day is a Sabbath, the 15th and the 22nd are a Sabbath. I think three out of four is pretty good because the evidence is absolute that that would make the 29th day of every month the fourth Sabbath. How about that? We've never done something like that before, have we? We can now see that being proved out scripturally, the 8th, the 15th, and the 22nd being true Sabbath days. Now, let me show you a fun one 
before we get into the part with John and Exodus. Now, remember, we just saw this, right? We were just talking in here, and we're going to come back to this again. <coughs> what is this made every made the man every whit whole on the Sabbath day? What is the Sabbath day? The Sabbath day is the eighth day. <clears throat> John chapter 7 is all about tabernacles and then him talking about the last day. The last day. Okay? So let's go to, let me show you this one in Revelation 13 first. This is just a, a fun little side note one to give a little bit more insight. Take a little breather for a moment and give a little bit more insight into the mark of the beast. Watch this. Okay. Uh, where is it? Right here. In Revelation 13, verse 15, it said, And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast. So a lot of people <coughs> believed, including myself in years past, that it was going to be some sort of image, right? That, that what is... <coughs> this mark going to be now we know the mark is something separate right something on the hand or forehead and so forth but this image many people believe that maybe it would be some sort of statue or worshiping thing or something but i'm going to show you i don't believe that's the case at all you're going to see that this word for image likeness image resemblance sounds familiar doesn't it doesn't this sound familiar in the likeness of, in the resemblance, in the, in the image of? Do you know when we go to Revela uh, Genesis chapter 1, remember, this is the spirit portion. So remember that John the Baptist, he was born, right? He, he, he was conceived with the spirit. He was spirit filled right from the beginning. This is the, the John pre-trib group, those in Christ spirit filled, going first and the remnant remaining to work at the eighth day after seven day wedding those who are gone to the seven day wedding are the spirit filled you see that they're the spirit filled guys this is that connection so now with john in this representing those first um uh eight days if you will or the 50 you know the the beginning at the escape we know that this is the mark group Okay, the first group is the Luke group, the spirit-filled like John. Luke chapter 1, that John group. And then what do you have? The light. We all know this relates to the Mark group. The days that would be as thousands if we were there in time. Well, if you remember what happens to this group, we find out in verse 24 or 26 that they said, And God said, Let us make man in our image a shade, a resemblance, right? A figure, an idol, a vain show, an image. It sounds quite similar to the likeness, resemblance, image, statue. Sounds quite similar, doesn't it? Well, was it because there was a statue? Was there something made? No. It was man, right? It was the males and females in the light portion that relates to Mark that was created. Well, when we come back to Revelation 13, 15, and we look up this word for image, which is the Greek word 1504, check this out. The Greek word 1504, when you look at it in the book of Revelation, it starts there in Revelation 13, verse 14. And in Blue Letter Bible, it shows you one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight places eight places in scripture where this word for image is used in the book of Revelation. All eight of them are about the image of the beast. This image of the beast. Isn't it interesting? We know how to do this, but our brother Jake discovered this one by clicking on the word image and seeing where it relates to, because how does it help us? How can we get a greater understanding of it if we can see where it connects in the Gospels, right? What kind of information can we get from it in the Gospels? Well, it turns out it's in Luke, 
Mark, and Matthew only used one time, and in all three cases, it's the same context. Listen to this. Let's go to Luke chapter 20. Okay. It's the same warning as to what the image is. Luke 20, starting verse 22. Is it lawful for us to give tribute unto Caesar or no? But he perceived their craftiness and said unto them, Why tempt you me? Verse 24. Show me a penny whose image and subscription has it. They answered and said, Caesar's. Essentially, all three of them are telling us the exact same story. And what is the word image? It's the image on what? On the money. It's the image on the money. It's the image, most likely, of the beast on the currency. In those days, it was Caesar. In the end of days, whose image that people have been trying to understand is it going to be? Whatever the image of the beast is, it's connected to the currency. And do you know how I showed that that word image and the similar sounding in the Hebrew to the word image, which is related to the light group, which is directly related to the mark group at the time of seals, which is Revelation 13, when the Antichrist gets his power and it's going to be the image of the beast and the buying and selling and the mark of the beast. All of them are connected to the beast and his image will be connected to the currency of the buying and selling. Watch this. Do you know, did you notice where else it was? In Romans chapter 1. Let's go to Romans chapter 1. You'll remember this discussion in Romans chapter 1. We've shared it before. Down to verse 23. Remember this? Let's start in verse 21. Because that when, you knew, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, Neither were they thankful, because, uh, uh, but became vain. Remember, that was part of the description of image in Genesis 1 at the creation of those males and females in the time of the days, which is the Mark groups. In their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into, here it is, an image image made like unto corruptible men. This entire story here is about Genesis 1 when the males and females that were created were corrupted in vanity after the creation there with the Lord and those fallen angels that came and Lucifer was a part of it, right? The sun, the moon, and that representation, those planets that are the wanderers that fell are the representation of them. And there they are right there. This is the exact same typology that we have pointed to, to the creation story, to say it's the exact timing of the Lucifer type Antichrist in the end of days. And here we are seeing that this word for image is directly connected in context to the image of the beast that is going to be connected to the currency of the beast as Caesar was in his day. How's that for a little bit more insight, right? All of it connected directly to the same time frame we had it connected to back in the day. It's awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Now let's go a step further. Let me show you this from Revelation, oh, should I do it? How long are we into this now? Okay, I just checked. You guys don't know, but I just checked. I'm about 224 into it. I'm going to keep going. All right. Now, I want to show you this right here. You're going to see how this awesome just connects to, to John 7, to Exodus, to, to all of these things. And I believe the connection is directly related to the disciple workers of Luke, as I was telling you about in the beginning. Listen to what it says. 
Uh, where is it? Did I highlight it here? Verse 6. Listen to this. Revelation 17, verse 6. And I saw the woman drunken, listen to this, with the blood of the saints. If we go to Revelation 13, look at what we see. In Revelation 13, uh, when Antichrist gets his power to continue for 42 months, uh, he's going to speak, speak blasphemous things to the Lord. In verse 7 of Revelation 13, it says, And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindred and tongues and nations. Okay? So he's going to be killing the saints. He's going to have power and authority, and he's going to overcome the saints, and they're going to die. But do you know what they're not being told? The saints that are dying are not, quote unquote, the martyrs who have put their necks on the line. We go back to Revelation 17, 6. Listen to what the rest of it says. Okay? Drunken with the blood of the saints, comma, and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. Those are two separate groups, brothers and sisters. Those are two separate groups of people, meaning there are those saints who are going to be dying during the time of tribulation. But they are not the ones who were martyrs who had put their necks on the line, for which the martyrs means witnesses. Who are the witnesses martyrs who put their necks on the line? They're the Luke group, the Luke 24, Smyrna, Priscilla, and Aquila types, who are the ones putting their necks on the line for the churches of the Gentiles during the time of seals. You see? So what does this lead us to? Well, let's show it. For anybody that's newer to the ministry, in the intro series of videos, in the intro series, you can come read, uh, watch more about this revelation. It's called the mystery of the comma and, okay? A comma and the word and that follows. If it's just a comma, it means one, two, three, four. It's just a sequence. And then if you have the comma and an and, if there's another number after it, that means one, two, three, four, five comma and six, that means you're adding it, okay? You're adding now six. If it's just, if it's comma and, it's a separate thing that's added to it. And it's an incredible revelation that we showed in this a few years ago. And, and it, it, the examples are everywhere. You'll, you'll see them in that video. One of them is, for example, Revelation chapter 12, verse 14, the time and comma and times comma and a half a time. If you go to um, uh, 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 Daniel chapter 12, you read about time comma times comma and a half. There's no and between the time and times. There's only a comma. And that difference is the difference of one year in the revelation of counting it. So in Revelation 12, it's one plus two plus a half. That's three and a half years. In Daniel 12, it's one, two plus a half. You see? That's two and a half years. That's the time Satan's going to have power in the second half of trumpets. But the Lord comes at the end of six years, remember? Matthew's transfiguration. The Lord comes after six years, binds them, deals with them, and all destroys the enemies and everything that takes place in that final 14th year before the final jubilee which comes in the 15th final year so this is exactly what we're seeing here and this is what caught my attention today or yesterday it's the blood of the saints comma and with the blood of the martyrs of jesus who are the ones that belong to jesus right who are the ones putting their necks on the line for the churches of the Gentiles, right? It was Priscilla and Aquila who put their necks on the line as martyrs. And what did it call them? The first fruits of Atia 
unto Christ. They are the first fruits of Atia unto Christ. They are those in Christ who put their necks on the line. We know who they are in Revelation, as we've shared many times. They're the ones from Revelation chapter 2, starting in verse 8, the church of Smyrna. You see? And when we come to verse 10, um, uh, 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 many of you, some of you shall be put into prisons, many of you tried, and shall have tribulation 10 days, but be faithful unto death, and I will give thee the crown of life. Verse 11 goes on to say, he that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Those who are not hurt of the second death are in Revelation chapter 20, which is when the Lord comes at the end of 13 years, right? At the end of 13 years, fulfills the 14th year, Satan is bound and destroyed for a thousand years. And what does it say in Revelation 20, verse 4? Starting in verse 4. And I saw the thrones and they that sat on them, and judgment was given unto them. Now listen to this. And I saw the souls of them which were beheaded. Who are the ones that put their necks on the line? The same ones that will be connected to those being beheaded. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded. So what is this the difference of? There are the saints in the blood of the saints, those that have died during tribulation of seals. But there's a specific group a specific group who are the ones that get beheaded. Not everyone who is a saint dying during the time of seals is a martyred witness who gets beheaded. Maybe they're shot, like I said, right? Maybe they're starved. Maybe they're killed in all sorts of different ways. But there is a specific group of martyred, beheaded witnesses putting their necks on the line for Christ. And listen to what it says. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness. Remember this word? Who are the witnesses? Bear witness, the evidence, right? That are what? The martyrs of Christ. Do you see? That were beheaded for the witness of Christ. Do you know there's no mention of saints here? because all the saints aren't resurrected to rule and reign with Christ for the thousand years. Only those who put their necks on the line and were beheaded for Christ, as well as probably those who survive, they'll still be there at the end, right? Quite possibly. <laughs> and you're gonna see how this connects to Exodus 34, 22. So we're seeing <clears throat> that it is the beheaded witnesses who were the martyrs who put their necks on the line and that they're the ones being resurrected who will reign and rule with Christ a thousand years. The rest of the dead are not going to be resurrected till the thousand years are over. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. On such the second shall not have the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with them a thousand years. Who are they? The ones who have part in the first resurrection. There's only one group in scripture in, in Revelation that we're told that shall not be hurt by the second death. Who, who had to have tribulation and some would be faithful unto death. This is not talking about the saints. It is talking about the martyrs of Jesus Christ. And it is those who will not taste of not be heard of the second death, who are those who will rule and reign with them for a thousand years. They are the martyr witnesses. They are <clears throat> the Priscilla's and Aquila's. They are the the Luke. What is it? Luke's uh, chapter twelve. They are the Luke chapter twelve group disciples that he told he was going to come back with and he was going to eat with them when he came back from the wedding. This is the same group in Luke 24 that we see he comes back after his resurrection, after the eight days, and on the eighth day comes and meets with this group 
who are the two on the road to Emmaus, represented as the line of Dan and the line of Ephraim on the good side of Dan, the overcoming eagles like Aquila, his name is Eagle, and he comes and he eats with them and he serves them just like he said he would and the prophetic understanding of that he will. And what does he call them? Watch this. He opens unto them their understanding, which as we know, it's the same understanding of the understanding of the Antichrist from Revelation 13. Do you see all this is all connected? It's crazy. And listen to what it says. Luke 24, verse 47, about this, this group. And that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Who are the witnesses? Booyah. The martyrs. The faithful witnesses putting their necks on the line for Christ Jesus. We know some of them are going to be put to death. And we know some of them will survive alive. Now when we go to Revelation chapter 6 and 7, we're going to get more clarity. Because there were two ways, but I leaned to the other way in the fifth seal. By the fifth seal, Antichrist was already here. Antichrist already started killing. Necks were already put on the line. Witnesses were dying. But this group right here, it is not the, 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 the saints. These are the ones that we see that put their necks on the line. Listen to what it says, starting in Revelation 6, verse 9. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, does thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes, okay, like the Luke group, right? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet a little season until their, here it is, fellow servants also and their brethren should uh, uh that should be killed as they were should be f fulfilled so there's the saints that are still going to be dying but their fellow servants who are the fellow servants who are the servants they're the smyrna workers during seals they're the apostle workers of ephesus they're the 144,000 during the time of trumpets. And then you've got those who are going out during the millennial reign. These are all the servants of the Lord. But their fellow servants are the ones who were working with them during seals. So it's saying that there's still a group of you that still need to die or that will still die along with some saints in this little season before it's over. <clears throat> this is them. This isn't the saints that are dying only. The fellow servants is directly connected to those who put their necks on the line. They're the ones under the altar crying out. So when we come to Revelation 7 and we see the, the great multitude rapture, this is the mid-trib great multitude rapture. Okay, listen to what we read in verse 9 midway through. And it said, stood before the throne and there stood in tongues and stood before the throne and before the lamb clothed with white robes comma and palms in their hands so the way to look at this was these were the ones that were dead is the white robes and these were the ones with palms in their hands okay these the ones with the palms in their hands are the ones that survive alive to the point of the mid-trib rapture of the great multitude. <clears throat> but the ones with the white robes are the ones who were martyrs who had put their necks on the line. And listen to the description we get of this. 
when we come to Revelation verse 7, 13, right to the end, it's all about them. Listen to what it says. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? So he's really interested in this one group that have the white robes. Not the ones with palms in their hands, not the other saints that have died, but this specific group that was given white robes. <clears throat> and verse 14 continues, And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest, I always find this one so funny as well. There's a few pieces of scripture that are actually pretty hilarious in conversation because you have one of the elders in heaven showing them this and saying, hey, John, don't you know who these guys are in white robes? He's like, dude, I haven't got a clue. What are you asking me for? You know who they are. That's exactly, that's, that's kind of conversation happening. It's pretty funny. And he said unto them, these are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white, listen to this, in the blood of the Lamb. Now, when we had looked at this before, I believed that this was talking about the white robes, meaning those in the white robes were everybody that died during seals. You'll remember this as I was trying to make this connection a couple years ago. And at one point, I had believed that these were the martyrs and then I switched and I thought, no, these aren't the martyrs. These are the ones that just died during tribulation of seals. And they're not the same ones in part in the resurrection. Well, you're going to see that that's not the case. This is what we're seeing here. These are the ones that put their necks on the line. These are the ones given white robes and crying out that have died. And there's more of them to the end of the six year of seals that are going to die. But then there's also other brethren, which are the saints that are dying. But there's fellow servants and there's their brother and fellow servants, all right? And so what we're seeing is that these in the white robes are not simply those that died during seals, and that these are the ones that are alive with palms in their hands. Are these the ones that were alive still with palms in their hands <clears throat> when the Lord comes at the end of the sixth seal? Yes, but those in the white robes are not all those who died during seals. It is only those who put their necks on the line and have died putting their necks on the line. Because listen to this wording. And have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. <coughs> Excuse me. So when we had seen this before, we'd make a point of saying, see, they made them white. This is the white that's only used twice, which is connected to Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9 is what? At the end of six days as years of seals, when the Lord is coming at the end of the sixth seal. And we see in this, in Mark 9 verse 3, it says, And his garment became shining, exceeding white as snow, as, uh, uh, so as no fuller on earth, can whiten, there's the other word used for it, can whiten them. So who is then this reference of this white when we see this whitened reference being made white to those who had the white robes? Well, we see that the connection is that they, they made them white. So the, the context that was believed to be understood at this point was that these are the ones that had to go through tribulation to make their robes white. <clears throat> but that's not the case. That's not what we get from this, actually. These are the ones who volunteered or were chosen by the Lord and agreed to be the seals workers and willingly put their necks on the line. And this made white, listen to what it says, in the blood of the Lamb. They made their robes white in the blood of the Lamb. Do you know why? Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Remember I said there's this distinguishing factor within the quote-unquote first fruits pre-trib going as the bride of Christ. There, there's a group 
it, within the first fruits <clears throat> that are this Priscilla and Aquila worker remnant bride first fruits being referenced, just as I showed in Romans 16. Well, this is the context that you're going to see here. Yes, everybody going pre-trib is, is in Christ's spirit filled. As we've read here many times in Romans uh, 8, starting in verse 1. <clears throat> but there is a more specifically directed one in relation to the heirs with Christ. Because you see, not everybody going pre-trib or connected to pre-trib is an heir with Christ, meaning they will rule and reign with them. You're not going to have a uh, 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 hundred and forty some million people pre-trib, and those that have already died in Christ since the Holy Spirit two thousand years ago. So maybe like three hundred million people ruling and reigning with Christ during the millennium. It's absurd to think so. You see, but they are co-heirs with Christ in the third heaven, <clears throat> you see? So where do we get the first piece of this understanding? We get it from Luke, is it chapter 20? Yes, in Luke chapter 20, where we got this comma and section as well about the woman who died and uh, the woman who had seven husbands, each died, remarried, died, remarried, and then she dies, who's gonna be her husband, right? And in Luke, 20 starting in verse 34 it says and jesus answering said unto them the children of this world marry and are given in marriage verse 35 is key well and 36 but 35 but they which shall be accounted worthy who are the accounted worthy the pre-trib group they that shall be accounted worthy of that world this is the pre-trib group luke 21 verse 36 who are the pre-trib accounted worthy to escape all these things and are going to be in the third heaven. And then you have the comma and, a separate group of them, and the resurrection of the dead. You see, who are those who are part of the first resurrection? Those who put their necks on the line. They're a part of this same group of the pre-trib, but they remain to stay in Christ. And their reward is the resurrection from the dead, the first resurrection for which they will rule and reign with him and the second death has no power over them. You see, <clears throat> there's the distinguisher again of that first fruits that goes to the third heaven compared to the first fruits, first fruits Priscilla and Aquila type, Luke 24 type that remain, that will work for him in Christ. So what do we see in this? When we go to, oh, there it is, Romans 8. When we're seeing this other group more specifically told to us about the heirs with Christ, starting in verse 14, again, we know it is a group, a larger group that goes to the third heaven. They're co-heirs with Christ in the third heaven. But there is a smaller <clears throat> group of first fruits who are co heirs who will rule and reign with Christ on the earth. Okay? Starting in Romans 8, verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. You see, part of the first creation. That gap theory, verse 1 and 2 of Genesis 1. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but have this, received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself bears witness within our spirit that we are ch the children of God. And if children, here it comes, then heirs, heirs of God, comma, and joint heirs with Christ. Listen to this. Here's the answer. If so be that we suffer with him that we may be also glorified together. That we suffer with him. <clears throat> to experience pain jointly or of the same kind 
specifically persecution. Do you see the difference now? Yes, there is a suffering in this life and, <clears throat> you know, and, and being persecuted for being in Christ and those coming against you. Yes, that's the is and that group in this very beginning of the is to come that will go to the third heaven co-heirs with Christ. But there's a much more specific co-heirs with Christ who will bear witness putting their necks on the line as first fruits who will suffer in a sense as he suffered and willingly put their necks on the line, who will become joint heirs, co-heirs with Christ and be glorified together with him. When does this glorifying take place? At the end. Do you get it? When was Christ glorified? At the resurrection? When are these guys who are co-heirs, co-heirs, joint heirs with Christ, when are they going to be glorified? At their resurrections? Hello. You following? You see that? So what we're seeing is that these in white robes, it's all about those who put their necks on the line who are those being seen there in heaven. And this entire conversation is that they made their robes white in the blood of the lamb because they are covered in his blood and they put their necks on the line for him having washed their robes in his blood being made white. It wasn't the other context of the saints that have also died along the way. It's all about who this specific group is being given white robes. Listen to what it goes on to continue saying. <clears throat> Therefore, they are, so again, only them. They are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the lamb which is in the midst of the throne, listen to this, shall feed them, comma, and listen to this, shall lead them unto living fountains of waters. <clears throat> Did you hear that? Shall lead them, not has led them. This is still future tense. And shall lead them unto fountains of living waters. When do the fountains of living waters come into the scene in the end of days of tribulation? Not till the end of tribulation. How about we look at a chapters to years from the book? Uh, sorry, to the chapters to years chart. Remember the end of 14 years? <clears throat> this in, in Ezekiel, in chapter 47, the typology isn't the start of the 14 years. It's the end of the 14 years, right? It, it's in that time frame. Look what happens when we go to Ezekiel 47. Ezekiel chapter 47, water flowing from the temple. Let's have a look at this. Ezekiel 47, starting in verse 1. Afterward, he brought me again unto the door of the house, and behold, waters issued out from under the threshold of the house eastward. <coughs> For the forefront of the house stood toward the east, and the waters came down from under the right side of the house at the south of the side and see more waters and went through. Uh, verse three, eastward and the waters flew through to the waters or to the ankle. Verse four, again measured a thousand and brought me through the waters. The waters were to my knees and brought me through the waters and the waters were to my loins. 
verse 5, Afterward, he measured a thousand, and it was a river that I could not pass over, for the waters were risen, waters to swim in, a river that could not be passed over. <coughs> and he said unto me, Son of man, thou, thou hast seen this. Then he brought me and caused me to return to the brink of the, of the river. Now, when I had returned, behold, at the bank of the river, listen to this, were many trees. How about that, guys? How about that? Were many trees. What are trees representative? Fruit-bearing trees, those who bear fruit. There were many trees as this river of water flowing from the Lord, from the temple, when everything is going to get renewed, he is brought to the edge of the river where there are many trees on, the sound, on one side and on the other. Verse 8, Then he said unto me, These waters issue outward toward the east country and go down into the desert and into the sea, which bring forth unto the sea the waters shall be healed. And it came to pass that everything that liveth which moveth whithersoever the water shall come shall live. Hello. And there shall be a very great multitude of fish because these waters shall come thither and they shall be healed and everything shall live whither the river cometh. This is all about the end of tribulation when the water will flow from the Lord from the temple and will renew the earth. What do we see at the end of this? In the middle to the end, we see starting in Ezekiel 47 verse 13, the two portions of land that go to Joseph. And in verse 48, what do you see? In chapter 48 of Ezekiel, the last chapter, we see all the tribes being given their portion of land, which in our chapters to years is the beginning of the final jubilee after the final two sevens, the final jubilee when what happens? When they're brought back from where they were hidden, where they were placed in the wilderness for a time and times and half a time to the end of the 14th year, and they will be returned being brought to their land that they were promised after the Lord renewed it at the end of the 14th year and renewed the land, renewed the waters. And where do we get this revelation from as well? From Isaiah chapter 65. Judgment and salvation. When we get to verse, uh, starting in Isaiah 65, verse 17, for behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth. This is not the create the new. This is not the, the new Jerusalem coming down. This is the new as in the definition that goes to the Hebrew word 2318. That means to rebuild and to repair by the waters, the living waters that flow out at the end of tribulation at the Lord's return. Okay, when does it say here in Isaiah 65, verse 20, there shall be no more thence in infinite days, nor an, nor an old man that hath not fulfilled his days, for a child shall die a hundred years old. But the sinner being, uh, but the sinner being a hundred years old shall be accursed. What, why are they living so old again? Because when the Lord re re returns, remember what happens. He's now going to be seen by all he's going to be seen the world is going to freak out they're going to see the one who they pierced <coughs> he's going to renew and replenish the earth at the last trump what happened at the last trump the mystery is over the world's going to see him he's going to destroy the enemy replenish the earth renew the earth and what do we know from first corinthians 15 that at the last trump 
Those who remain shall be changed in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. That is what that's talking about. And people will be living now to hundreds of years old as it was in the beginning. Hence, why I believe at the very end of tribulation, when the millennial reign is about to begin, the Lord will bring everything back to as it was in the beginning. Hence, at that time, Taurus will be renewed to be the beginning of every year from that day forward. <clears throat> but you see, at his coming, being revealed so that the whole world can see him, at the last day, because what's it connected to? It's connected to the seventh day of trumpets, and then what? The eighth day, which is what? The new beginning. And the tribes getting their lands. What is that a picture of? It's directly related <clears throat> to the picture of Deuteronomy chapter 16. What do we know about Deuteronomy 16 and the three feasts of the Lord? Seven days, feast of weeks one day, feast of tabernacles seven days. Seven, one, seven. But the end of days, it begins with the feast of weeks. Seven years of seals relate to the bread of affliction for the seven days of unleavened bread. Then you've got the seven days of the Feast of Tabernacles. And then what do you get? The eighth day. And the eighth day is the last great day. It is the new beginning. So you've got pre-trib, seven years of seals, mid-trib, seven years of trumpets, post-trib, and the new beginning. What is this the revelation of? It's the revelation of the 50 days to the Feast of Weeks, right? That become first, then the seven years as seven days of unleavened bread, the seven years as seven days of tabernacles, and the great eighth day as the final jubilee and the beginning of the millennial reign. So what is it about? Tabernacles. The end is all about tabernacles. He's going to be revealed. It's the last great day. And everybody's going to go to their own home. You get it? Everybody's going to go to their own home. It's incredible. Well, look at what happens in why I started going down this path. And I'm going to finish this up for you. Don't worry. We're still going to go to John 7. Remember in Exodus 34, 22, <clears throat> it says, And thou shalt observe the feast of weeks of the first fruits of the wheat harvest. Okay? Remember, yes, it's a whole group going first, and they're guests at the wedding, and so on and so forth, right? Or that pre-trip bride, you want to call it. But there is that remnant portion that remains that are his first fruits of the wheat harvest, just as Priscilla and Aquila, just as Luke 24, just as Smyrna, who put their necks on the line, but there's also going to be some who survive. Well, listen to when it says they're going to be observed. And thou shalt observe the feast of weeks of the first fruits of the wheat harvest, comma, and the feast of ingathering. What did we show the feast of ingathering was? You got it, the feast of tabernacles. And the feast of tabernacles is what? At the year's end. Which means there's going to be an observing of a group of first fruits wheat harvest workers who are going to be observed at the end of tabernacles in this feast of ingathering that's going to take place. It's not going to happen this year. It's not going to be like... The pre-trip happens, there's 50 days, and then another, what, 45, 60 days, whatever, and then it's tabernacles, and that's when it's going to be observed? No. Because the Feast of Ingathering at the year's end is at the end of tabernacles, is, is at the end of the seven years of trumpets that will culminate with the seven days of tabernacles to the last great day. This is when they're going to be observed. What do you think happens at this time? the resurrection of the dead in Christ who will rule and reign 
with him. It's the first fruits of the wheat harvest who worked and remained and put their necks on the line. Now let's go to John chapter 7. <clears throat> and let's see how this connects. And everything we just showed is connected to this group being led to living waters at the appearing of Christ and the resurrection at those living waters at the last day. Listen to this. In John chapter 7, starting in verse 4, I'll change the color of this just so you guys could see it in verse 6 and so forth. <clears throat> Let me see how this works. How is this color? No, oh, it's still too bright. Let me do the lighter purple. It'll still be a little bit hard for you guys to see, but I want you guys to at least see it to get the gist and not just what I'm saying. You're going to see that as I've been leading in all of this, what we're seeing here is the Lord not only <clears throat> there at the very beginning, but remember what I said at the beginning. Remember I said it's going to come full circle, that this first fruits worker seals group, he tells them in Luke chapter 12, obviously right before he leaves for the wedding which this in Luke chapter in John chapter 7 is him telling them what will take place this is the typology there there's a whole event like he's talking about what is going to take place at the end when it's all over and this is why in John chapter 8 what we're really seeing here is the beginning of the 40 days or the escape at the early in the morning, like we read in Luke 21, after verse 36, when it says to stand before the Son of Man, and they, they went early in the morning into the temple to hear him, and he taught. You see, and then you got the adulterous woman standing before him. You've got the reference that he could throw the stone, right? Go and sin no more. And then you see this typology of him coming as the light in the darkness, remember? Remember this light in the darkness? This is all about when he comes to start his 40 days at his birth after the first attack. Just like Isaiah 9 said, he's coming to shine to be the light in the darkness at the time of his birth to start his 40 days. Which means this is connected to the time of the escape at the beginning of the 50 days. Which means what we're seeing here in John 7 when you read the, the, the wording that's here, it sounds like he's talking to that first fruits Luke remnant bride worker portion that he meets with right before the 50 days begins. And he's telling them what's going to take place at the end. Because listen to what this says. Starting in John 7 verse 4. For there is no man that does anything in secret and he himself seek to be known openly. If thou do these things, listen to this, show thyself to the world. When is the Lord going to show himself to the world? When is the whole world going to know that he is King of Kings and Lord of Lords and the whole world's going to see him? Not until he returns, feet down on the Mount of Olives. At the seventh trumpet. At the end of tribulation. How about verse 6? Then Jesus said unto them, My time is not yet come, but your time is always ready. You see that? Like he's talking to his disciples, get ready. My time isn't yet come. It's not my time to show myself to the whole world. It's not coming till the end when I come as living waters. But he says, for you, your time is now. We come to verse 8. Go ye up into the feast. Go, uh, 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 I go not yet unto the feast, for my time is not yet full come. Verse 7, he says he's going up in secret. Uh, sorry, verse 10, he says in secret. Let's see, let's see. 
He's talking about his doctrine. Here we are talking about the, the Sabbath and the circumcision. So we're seeing this day again connected to a, a, a birth and a circumcision like John's. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. Uh, many people believed on him. Wait, let me see. I think I've got it highlighted more specifically. Right here. Uh, circumcision. And then Jesus says in verse 33, then said Jesus unto them, yet a little while I am with you. And then I go unto him that sent me. So again, he's, he's, he's talking to this disciple group. It's your time to go. My time is not yet. If somebody's going to make themselves known, they should make themselves known for the whole world to see. We know that's not till the end of trumpets. Okay. So what do we know? He's coming. He's telling them, look, be ready when I return from the wedding and I'm going back to my father. Watch this. In verse 35. Then said the Jews among themselves, whither will he go that we shall not find him? Listen to this. Will he go to the dispersed among the Gentiles and teach the Gentiles? Did Jesus go and teach the Gentiles? Right? At what point did Jesus go and teach the Gentiles? I don't know of any point Jesus goes to teach the Gentiles, do you? Well, how about what we know about this wording? Teach the Gentiles, right? Go teach the world. The Gentiles is the world, non-Jew. Jesus never went out to teach the Gentiles. That ended up being Paul's job, remember? So what are they talking about here? How about this? What do we know about teaching of the Gentiles? Remember Matthew chapter 28? When he comes feet down on the Mount of Olives, and we know that he's going to appoint the, the, those of the 12 tribes, right? And they're going to go out during the millennial reign, teaching the world to observe the ways of the Lord. Remember in Luke, the disciple workers in Luke 24, they're preaching and teaching. You see, when we go to Mark, they're preaching and teaching. When we get to Matthew, there's no more preaching because he now has made himself shown to the world. He has shown himself and made himself known to the world. So what does it say? Just like the seventh trumpet, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. And ye therefore, uh, uh, go ye therefore and teach all nations. What does this say? And teach the Gentiles. Go, therefore, and teach the Gentiles, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Now we know what this means, right? We've known this for a few years now. It's until he's here, until the end of the millennial reign. There's no more preaching. So these guys are going to go out at the end of tribulation. And they're going to go teach the Gentiles. And he is now here with them always until the end of the world. Well, isn't that exactly what John just said? When he shows himself, he's not going to show himself until the end of, tri of tribulation. He's telling a group, hey, you guys, your time is always, you can go. Remember, they hated me first, but I'm going to have to go. Right? Well, listen to what else he says. So he went to the disperse of the Gentiles, of course, again, talking about what? This is a story. This chapter is about tabernacles. It's about tabernacles. So he's going to show himself what? At the end of tabernacles. He, there, at the end of tabernacles, at the end of the seven years of trumpets, which is the typology of the seven days of tabernacles, He's then going to what? 
send them out to teach among the Gentiles. Well, look what else happens. In verse 37 of John 7, in the last day, look at this. How many times have we been sharing on this terminology for the last day? Final, ends of, latter end. So at the latter end of days, that great day of the feast, which is what? The eighth day. At the end of the seven days as seven years of trumpets is the last eighth great day, just like we shared. It's the final jubilee, great day. What do we know happens? What do we know happens? We were just talking about it. Which led us from Revelation 7, when he said he's going to lead them to living waters. We went to Ezekiel and saw at the end of the chapters to years, the 14th year of tribulation that the living waters are there flowing out from the temple and they are rivers of living water and there will be trees like fruit bearing trees lining the rivers. Who were the fruit bearing trees? That's right, the workers, those who bear fruit, the rest would be cut down. And listen to what it says in John 7 on that last great day. He, uh, um, uh, to the last great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture saith, listen to this, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living waters. When does this actually happen in the revelation of tribulation? At the end of the 14 years of tribulation at the last great day. Do you understand what Ezekiel or or Exodus chapter 34 was now saying? That they're observing this first fruits worker group are going to be observed at the Feast of Ingathering at the year's end, which is going to be at the end of tribulation, at the end of the seven as tabernacles, and they're going to be observed. Why? Because they are the ones who have part in the first resurrection, who put their necks on the line for the Lord, and this is the time when they will be observed. What did Ezekiel tell us At the end, after those living waters went out, after the living waters went out, all the tribes are given their portion of land. So what are they doing? They're all going to their own home, correct? Well, let's finish this off with John chapter 7 and see what it says after the last day and he is the rivers of living water look at what it says uh we go down never a man spake like him before and listen to what it says john 7 verse 53 and every man went to his own house come on On the last great day of the Feast of Tabernacles, represented as the 717-177, the final seven years of trumpets, when it's all over on the last great day, is the equivalent of days to years of the final jubilee when all tribes will be given their land and return to their own home when the Lord has what? Returns feet down on the Mount of Olives, showing himself unto the whole world. Brothers and sisters, I believe we've just got the mystery of of John chapter 7 and its connection 
to the pre-trib is the Lord giving a foreshadow, pre-telling his disciple workers their time is now, but the time of their show, uh, their time of their observing at their um, glory, as Romans 8 said, for those who will put their necks on the line as the co-heirs, their glory, who will take part in the glory as Christ did, which is the resurrection, will be at their resurrection when he shows himself to the world at the end of trumpets in tabernacles and in the last great day then all the tribes that were in the wilderness protected will return to go each and every one to their own home i told you we were going to cover some stuff today i told you it was going to be exciting jam-packed spirit-filled Brothers and sisters watching and praying, seeking and searching. I do believe the connection is the count from the 16th of Nisan. Sabbath 1, Sabbath 2, Sabbath 3. Oh, let me start over. April 7th begins the count to the first Sabbath of April 13th. Second Sabbath, April 20th. Third Sabbath, April 29th. Fourth Sabbath, May 6th. Fifth Sabbath, May 13th, 6th Sabbath, May 20th, and the 7th Sabbath, the 28th of May, 2023, in the Lord God's count from the Feast of Weeks, 70 years for them having come into the land, knowing that it was three, then the fourth to the Lord, and the fifth began for them. It is the revelation of the end of 70 years to the feasts of weeks in the Lord God's count that would then follow 50 days of which the eighth day is the Lord returning on his birthday to begin the 40 days coming as light in the darkness from the attack that took place in northern Israel, in Haifa, in Tel Aviv. The Lord will be here warning and doing his thing till the end of the 40 days. There will be three days where the disciples then will join the others in Jerusalem in a place appointed. They will receive the anointing of the Holy Ghost, will go out from Jerusalem, and Jerusalem will be attacked by Syria and those with them, and Jerusalem will be destroyed, and they will be removed for seven years, and the tribulation of the 14 years will begin at the attack on Jerusalem. Brothers and sisters, if this so be the, four, the 70th year coming to an end, which I do believe the revelation has proven, then hold on tight. Because we are only about 40 something or 40 or so, 39 or so days from the beginning of the pre-trib end of days. And just hold your breath because if this isn't it, then we know we're the 15th of Savan. But I believe this is John in the crunched time frame of the is to come. And this is the birth that scripture has revealed. He would come in the connection time frame of his birth for 40 days. Brothers and sisters, I know it was a long one, but I couldn't hold off. I wanted to share this one so badly with you. God bless you. I pray this blesses you. I pray this strengthens you. I pray it increases your knowledge, your understanding, your wisdom of digging into Scripture. As we continue to do as Enoch did, we will continue to seek and to search. We will continue to please the Lord because of our faith in Him and believe that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Brothers and sisters, God bless you. God bless your families. We'll talk to you soon. Bye for now.